for roll call, State of Wisconsin versus Jesse Kershevsky, case number 21 CF885, appearances please. Abby Nikolai, JJ Crawford, and Randy Sitzberger appearing for the state, good morning. Good morning. Donna Kukler and Pablo Galavis appearing with Jesse Kershevsky, good morning. Good morning. Uh, did the parties have an opportunity to review the final draft that was sent uh, on Friday from the state and do you approve? Yes, we do. All right, from the defense? Yes, it's fine. All right, then before I bring the jury out for the instructions and arguments, I wanted to circle back to juror number 28. And if there were any requests, that is the juror whose son uh, works for or with John Fryatt's son. It's the juror whose boss, I think he testified. and. There wasn't testimony from Mr. Fryett. There was some mention, I, I want to say twice, during the testimony. Uh, once was one of the witnesses who was stopped before kind of getting into detail. The other, and I think it was maybe Ms. Kukas, the other was during the interview of Ms. Kershevsky when Detective Cole was providing her with some information. That's probably the one I'm a little more concerned about. We have alternates for a reason, and so I just wanted to know if there were any requests before I have Madam Clerk have the uh, CCAP application randomize them. Anything from the state? No, thank you. Yes, uh, we would like him to be an alternate. I think out of an abundance of caution, uh, given uh, the nature of the case and the little bit of testimony and some of what he said when we had him here separately, even though... I think it was the defense that somewhat made that more of an issue than it needed to be. Um, I am going to have him uh, placed as one of the alternates and then we'll randomize the remaining um, 14 and then we'll know who all three. All three will still be kept um, in a separate jury room just in case something were to happen, and then of course we would address that scenario if and when. Um, but that's my plan for all of that, okay? Anything else we need to address prior to bringing the jury out? They all are here. Not from the state. Your Honor, just uh, could we consider maybe doing a break in between, after you've done instructions in the state's closing, maybe a break so that we could use that time to set up for our closing, depending on how it times out? I think it just depends on the timing. How long do you all think you'll go with your closings? I haven't put a time limit on because it's we had significant amount of testimony and it's an important case, so. Probably around 90 minutes. I think that that will be good to take a break. I always will have them stretch after I give before the state starts and then we'll take a mid-morning break before we come back out for the defense. Any idea how long? Uh, the defense closings will be? I'd say uh, less than two hours. Okay. Um, I know the jurors were looking forward to pizza last week. They're ordering pizza today. And so I had gotten a question of, when do you think we'll be there? And so um, I'm going to quick tell uh, our bailiffs, or Madam Clerk, you can do that when you go out there to tell them we're ready. Just let them know um, it might be later than I anticipated. Half an hour. We'll take a break, so it um, it, it won't. I, I don't. I thought maybe they could get it at noon. I'm not sure we'll be ready for them by noon to have that. Okay, so just let them know, oh. <laughs> and you can get them as well. as well right any issues with those from the state no, no. okay from the defense no <laughs> gotta be thorough I only said jury instructions so <laughs> seems dry in here today of course I have like a tickle now <laughs>
Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Good morning. I want to remind you that the instructions that I will be reading this morning, as you can see, I have a packet. I read them in two portions, the initial portion, which is the bulk of them. Then we'll start with the state doing their closing arguments. Uh, we'll take a mid-morning break. I think it'll time out perfectly for that. Uh, and then we'll come back for the defense to do their closings. After both parties have done closing, the state also gets a short rebuttal. Um, there's a few more instructions that I give you, and then after that, the case is given to you. But you will get the entire packet with you back in the jury room. And then, of course, there's the issue of the alternates. Um, I wait until uh, right after I hand the pay off the instructions to give to you and I'll notify you who those uh, three will be. You three will still be here, kept in a separate jury room with the same instruction. I won't read it, but you know not to discuss the case, um, even with the two others who are there, uh, because you're technically not part of the deliberations, but I will keep you just in case there's a need uh, for uh, one of those who are deliberating if something were to happen, uh, whether you all today, tomorrow, whatever it is, however long you take to deliberate, I, I just want to make sure we have that kind of cushion, uh, and that's why we have alternates. Um, so with that, I will start with my instructions, and once I'm done, I'll have you stand and stretch for a little bit too. All right, members of the jury, the court will now instruct you upon the principles of law which you are to follow in considering the evidence and in reaching your verdict. It is your duty to follow all of these instructions, regardless of any opinion you may have about what the law is or ought to be. You must base your verdict on the law I give you in these instructions. Apply that law to the facts in the case which have been properly proven by the evidence. Consider only the evidence received during this trial and the law as given to you by these instructions, and from these alone, guided by your soundest reason and best judgment, reach your verdict. If any member of the jury has an impression of my opinion as to whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty, disregard that impression entirely and decide the issues of fact solely as you view the evidence. You, the jury, are the sole judges of the facts and the court is the judge of the law only. The first count of the information in this case charges that Jesse R. Koshevsky on or about Wednesday, October 3, 2018, at N16 West W26543 Meadowgrass Circle in the city of Pewaukee, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did cause the death of Lynn Hernan with intent to kill that person contrary to section 940.01 sub 1 sub a of the Wisconsin statutes. First degree intentional homicide as defined in section 940.01 of the criminal code of Wisconsin is committed by one who causes the death of another human being with the intent to kill that person or another. Before you may find the defendant guilty of first degree intentional homicide, the state must prove by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the following two elements were present. One, the defendant caused the death of Lynn Hernan. Cause means that the defendant's act was a substantial factor in producing the death. Two, the defendant acted with the intent to kill Lynn Hernan. 
Intent to kill means that the defendant had the mental purpose to take the life of another human being or was aware that her conduct was practically certain to cause the death of another human being. When may intent exist? While the law requires that the defendant acted with intent to kill, it does not require that the intent exist for any particular length of time before the act is committed. The act need not be brooded over, considered, or reflected upon for a week, a day, an hour, or even for a minute. There need not be any appreciable time between the formation of the intent and the act. The intent to kill may be formed at any time before the act, including the instant before the act, and must continue to exist at the time of the act. Deciding about intent. You cannot look into a person's mind to find intent. Intent to kill must be found, if found at all, from the defendant's acts, words, and statements, if any, and from all the facts and circumstances in this case bearing upon intent. Intent and motive. Intent should not be confused with motive. While proof of intent is necessary for a conviction or to a conviction, proof of motive is not. Motive refers to a person's reason for doing something. While motive may be shown as a circumstance to aid in establishing the guilt of a defendant, the state is not required to prove motive on the part of a defendant in order to convict. Evidence of motive does not by itself establish guilt. You should give it the weight you believe it deserves under all the circumstances. If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant caused the death of Lynn Hernan with the intent to kill, you should find the defendant guilty of first-degree intentional homicide. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty. The second count of the information in this case charges that Jesse R. Koshevsky between approximately January 1 of 2016 and October 3 of 2018 at N16 W26543, Grass Circle Number A in the city of Pewaukee, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did intentionally transfer movable property of Lynn Hernan having a value that exceeds $100,000 without consent and with intent to permanently deprive the owner of possession of the property contrary to section 943.20 sub 1 sub a of the Wisconsin statutes. Theft is defined in section 943.20 sub 1 sub a of the criminal code of Wisconsin is committed by one who intentionally transfers movable property of another without consent and with intent to deprive the owner permanently of possession of the property. Before you may find the defendant guilty of this offense, the state must prove by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the following four elements were present. One, the defendant intentionally transferred movable property of another between January 1, 2016 and October 3 of 2018. The term intentionally means that the defendant must have had the mental purpose to transfer property. Movable property means property whose physical location can be changed. Two, the owner of the property did not consent to the transfer. Three, the defendant knew that the owner did not consent. Four, the defendant intended to deprive the owner permanently of possession of the property. Deciding about knowledge and intent. You cannot look into a person's mind to find knowledge and intent. Knowledge and intent must be found, if found at all, from the defendant's acts, words, and statements, if any, and from all the facts and circumstances in this case bearing upon knowledge and intent. If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all four elements of theft have been proved, you should find the defendant guilty. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty. The third count of the information in this case charges that Jesse R. Koshevsky, between approximately October 4 of 2018 and July 9 of 2019, at N16 W26543, Meadowgrass Circle Number A, in the city of Pewaukee, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did intentionally transfer movable property of the estate of Lynn Hernan 
to wit money having a value greater than $10,000 but does not exceed $100,000 without consent and with intent to permanently deprive the owner of possession of the property contrary to section 943.20 sub 1 sub a and 3 C of the Wisconsin statutes. Theft as defined in section 943.20 sub 1 sub a of the criminal code of Wisconsin is committed by one who intentionally transfers movable property of another without consent and with intent to deprive the owner permanently of possession of the property. Before you may find the defendant guilty of this offense, the state must prove by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the following four elements were present. One, the defendant intentionally transferred movable property of another between October 4 of 2018 and July 9 of 2019. The term intentionally means that the defendant must have had the mental purpose to transfer property. Movable property means property whose physical location can be changed. Two, the owner of the property did not consent to the transfer. Three, the defendant knew that the owner did not consent. Four, the defendant intended to deprive the owner permanently of the possession of the property. Deciding about knowledge and intent. You cannot look into a person's mind to find knowledge and intent. Knowledge and intent must be found, if found at all, from the defendant's acts, <clears throat> words and statements, if any. And from all the facts and circumstances in this case, bearing upon knowledge and intent. If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all four elements of theft have been proved, you should find the defendant guilty. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty. An information is nothing more than a written formal accusation against the defendant charging the commission of one or more criminal acts. You are not to consider it as evidence against the defendant in any way. It does not raise any inference of guilt. In reaching your verdict, examine the evidence with care and caution. Act with judgment, reason, and prudence. Defendants are not required to prove their innocence. The law presumes every person charged with the commission of an offense to be innocent. This presumption requires a finding of not guilty. Unless in your deliberations you find it is overcome by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty. The burden of establishing every fact necessary to constitute guilt is upon the state. Before you can return a verdict of guilty, the evidence must satisfy you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty. If you can reconcile the evidence upon any reasonable hypothesis consistent with the defendant's innocence, you must do so and return a verdict of not guilty. The term reasonable doubt means a doubt based upon reason and common sense. It is a doubt for which a reason can be given arising from a fair and rational consideration of the evidence or lack of evidence. It means such a doubt as would cause a person of ordinary prudence to pause or hesitate when called upon to act in the most important affairs of life. A reasonable doubt is not a doubt which is based on mere guesswork or speculation. A doubt which arises merely from sympathy or from fear to return a verdict of guilt is not a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is not a doubt such as may be used to escape the responsibility of a decision. While it is your duty to give the defendant the benefit of every reasonable doubt, you are not to search for doubt. You are to search for the truth. Evidence is first the sworn testimony of witnesses, both on direct and cross-examination, regardless of who called the witness. Second, the exhibits the court has received, whether or not an exhibit goes to the jury room. Third, any facts to which the lawyers excuse me, have agreed or stipulated or which the court has directed you to find. Anything you may have seen 
or heard outside the courtroom is not evidence. You are to decide the case solely on the evidence offered and received at trial. The district attorney and the attorneys for the defendant have stipulated or agreed to the existence of certain facts, and you must accept these facts as conclusively proved. In this case, the district attorney and the defendant's attorneys have stipulated to the following facts. Lynn Hernan received Quest food share benefits from the state of Wisconsin from 2015 through the date of her death. It is not necessary that every fact be proved directly by a witness or an exhibit. A fact may be proved indirectly by circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial evidence is evidence from which a jury may logically find other facts according to common knowledge and experience. Circumstantial evidence is not necessarily better or worse than direct evidence. Either type of evidence can prove a fact. Whether evidence is direct or circumstantial, it must satisfy you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed the offense before you may find the defendant guilty. Intent should not be confused with motive. While proof of intent is necessary to a conviction, proof of motive is not. Motive refers to a person's reason for doing something. While motive may be shown as a circumstance to aid in establishing the guilt of a defendant, the state is not required to prove motive on the part of a defendant in order to convict. Evidence of motive does not by itself establish guilt. You should give it the weight you believe it deserves under all of the circumstances. It is the duty of the jury to scrutinize and to weigh the testimony of witnesses and to determine the effect of the evidence as a whole. You are the sole judges of the credibility. That is the believability of the witnesses and of the weight to be given to their testimony. In determining the credibility of each witness, and the weight you give to the testimony of each witness, consider these factors. Whether the witness has an interest or lack of interest in the result of this trial. The witness's conduct, appearance, and demeanor on the witness stand. The clearness or lack of clearness of the witness's recollections. The opportunity the witness had for observing and for knowing the matters the witness testified about the reasonableness of the witness's testimony, the apparent intelligence of the witness, bias or prejudice if any has been shown, possible motives for falsifying testimony, and all other facts and circumstances during the trial which tend either to support or to discredit the testimony. Then give to the testimony of each witness the weight you believe it should receive. In, determining, in your determination of credibility, you must avoid any and all bias based on the witness's race, national origin, religion, age, ability, gender identity, sexual orientation, education, income level, or any other personal characteristic. There is no magic way for you to evaluate the testimony. Instead, you should use your common sense and experience. In everyday life, you determine for yourselves the reliability of things people say to you. You should do the same thing here. Evidence has been received that some of the witnesses in this trial have been convicted of crimes. This evidence was received solely because it bears upon the witness's character for truthfulness. It must not be used for any other purpose. Evidence has been presented regarding other conduct of the defendant for which the defendant is not on trial. Specifically, evidence has been presented that in 2010, the defendant attempted to obtain a car title loan at a payday lending store by using someone else's personal identifying information 
and attempted to open a savings account in the name of another person. If you find that this conduct did occur, you should consider it only on the issues of motive, intent, and absence of mistake or accident. You may not consider this evidence to conclude that the, that the defendant has a certain character or a certain character trait and that the defendant acted in conformity with that trait or character with respect to the theft offenses charged in this case. The evidence was received on the issues of motive, that is, whether the defendant had a reason to desire the result of the theft offenses charged, intent, that is, whether the defendant acted with the state of mind that is required for the theft offenses charged, absence of mistake or accident, that is, whether the defendant acted with the state of mind required for the theft offenses charged. You may consider this evidence only for the purposes I have described, giving it the weight you determine it deserves. It is not to be used to conclude that the defendant is a bad person and for that reason is guilty of the offenses charged. The state has introduced evidence of statements which it claims were made by the defendant. It is for you to determine how much weight if any, to give to each statement. In evaluating each statement, you must determine three things. Whether the statement was actually made by the defendant, only so much of a statement as was actually made by a person may be considered as evidence. Whether the statement was accurately restated here at trial, whether the statement or any part of it ought to be believed. You should consider the facts and circumstances surrounding the making of each statement, along with all the other evidence in determining how much weight, if any, the statements deserve. A defendant in a criminal case has the absolute constitutional right not to testify. Ms. Kershevsky's decision not to testify must not be considered by you in any way and must not influence your verdict in any manner. The jury has heard testimony and seen evidence that at times during the investigation, the defendant was in custody. The defendant's custodial status must not be considered by you in any way and must not influence your verdict in any manner. The jury also heard a statement that the defendant and Ms. Hernan are felons. This is not relevant and must not be considered by you in any way and must not influence your verdict in any manner. It must not be used for any other purpose and in particular, you should bear in mind that a criminal conviction at some previous time is not proof of guilt on the offenses now charged. An exhibit becomes evidence only when received by the court. An exhibit marked for identification and not received is not evidence. An exhibit received is evidence whether or not it goes to the jury room. Attorneys for each side have the right and the duty to object to what they consider are improper questions asked of witnesses and to the admission of other evidence which they believe is not properly admissible. <clears throat> You should not draw any sorry, you should not draw any conclusions from the fact an objection was made. By allowing testimony or other evidence to be received over the objection of counsel, the court is not indicating an opinion about the evidence. You jurors are the judges of the credibility of the witnesses and of the weight of the evidence. Disregard entirely any question that the court did not allow to be answered. Do not guess at what the witness's answer might have been. If the question itself suggested that certain information might be true, ignore the suggestion and do not consider it as evidence. During the trial, the court has ordered certain testimony to be stricken. Disregard all stricken testimony. 
The weight of the evidence does not depend on the number of witnesses on each side. You may find that the testimony of one witness is entitled to greater weight than that of another witness or even of several other witnesses. Remarks of the attorneys are not evidence. If the remarks suggested certain facts not in evidence, disregard the suggestion. In weighing the evidence, you may take into account matters of your common knowledge and your observations and experience in the affairs of life. Ordinarily, a witness may testify only about facts. However, a witness with specialized knowledge in a particular field may give an opinion in that field. In determining the weight to give to this opinion, you should consider the qualifications and credibility of the witness, the facts upon which the opinion is based, the reasons given for the opinion. Opinion evidence was received to help you reach a conclusion. However, you are not bound by any witness's opinion. During the trial, a witness was told to assume certain facts and then was asked for an opinion based upon that assumption. This is called a hypothetical question. The opinion does not establish the truth of the facts upon which it is based. Consider the opinion only if you believe the assumed facts upon which it is based have been proved. If you find that the facts stated in the hypothetical, hypothetical question have not been proved, then the opinion based on those facts should not be given any weight. Consider carefully the closing arguments of the attorneys, but their arguments and conclusions and opinions are not evidence. Draw your own conclusions from the evidence and decide upon your verdicts according to the evidence under the instructions given you by the court. Now, before we have the state come up to present their closing arguments, just wanna give you a chance to stand for a minute and stretch. Yeah, we can't do that. We'll have to. All right, thank you, everyone. Please be seated. Madam Reporter, you've got a good view of everyone you need to. All right. Attorney Nikolai, go ahead when you're ready. Thanks, Judge. Sorry, we're a little crooked. <coughs> States table. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And on behalf of the state's team, attorneys Crawford and Sitzberger and myself, as well as detectives Hoppy and Plenis and Mr. Volkanier, thank you so much for paying such close attention during this trial. I have to say that it was, it stuck out in my head when I would look over at how carefully you were all listening and we really do appreciate that. This is my opportunity to argue the case. The evidence is in and soon you'll be asked to deliberate whether we've met our burden in this case on all three counts. All three counts follow this theme of murder, greed, and lies that my co-counsel introduced during opening statements. And that's how we'll discuss it here this morning, starting with count one, the first degree intentional homicide of Lynn Hernan, and moving into the greed 
count two being the theft while Ms. Hernan was alive, and count three being the theft from Ms. Hernan's estate. When we talk about count one, the judge just read you the elements. Ladies and gentlemen, we submit to you that in this case, Ms. Kershewski caused Lynn Hernan's death with the intent to kill her. You heard moments ago that it's not necessary that every fact be proven directly by a witness or an exhibit, and that in fact circumstantial evidence can be just as powerful. Whether it's direct or circumstantial evidence, the only thing that matters is whether it satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt. The circumstances in this case are significant. The cause of death in this matter, as determined by Dr. Bedritsky, is poisoning. Tetrahydrosoline is a poison. Dr. Bedritsky talked to you about her job. It is her job for Waukesha County to make determinations on cause and manner of death. She told you that it took her almost a year to do that in this case. She was the only expert who actually saw Ms. Hernan. She performed the autopsy. She testified that she viewed Ms. Hernan's tissues microscopically. She sent numerous toxicological samples to NMS labs. She reviewed thousands of pages of medical records. She conducted research and consulted with other experts and considered the facts at the death scene. And ultimately, she told you without hesitation that the poisoning that occurred in this case was at the hand of another. That's what homicide means. Death at the hand of another. Dr. Bedritsky was not here to tell you who did that. She was not concerned with that at all when making these determinations. That's not her job. But she did testify that she considers this case to be unique in a couple different ways. Definitely, the toxicology was atypical. That scene was atypical. And she told you it was atypical both because of things that were there and things that weren't there. Like tetrahydrosoline bottles. Dr. Bedritsky told you that it was significant to her that of all the medication pills and bottles and powders at the scene, that Ms. Hernan's toxicology did not indicate elevated levels of those prescriptions. Certainly not fatal levels. There was only one poison in Ms. Hernan's toxicology, and it was eye drops, and they weren't on the scene. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that the misleading scene that caused investigators from day one to believe this was a pill overdose was very intentional. It was intentional by the only person who was there other than Ms. Hernan. It was an intentional way to mislead. This theme of Ms. Kershewski's intent being to mislead will carry us through the rest of the discussion this morning. And the motive? To get out of trouble, right? Because what was presented by Ms. Kershewski to the first responders at the scene was not at all what the actual cause of death was. Ms. Kershewski talked about how ill Ms. Hernan had been, how she liked to use her pills. There's no suicide note. Dr. Bedritsky talked to you Ms. Hernan was not on the verge of death. This chart looks at the substances we've talked about so many times in this case. Again, only one of them is a poison. And I submit to you that the fact that the poison is in the toxicology 
is circumstantial evidence of the person's intent who gave it to her. The other substances underneath the tetrahydrazoline are not anywhere near fatal levels. Dr. Bedritsky told you that even together, those other substances would not have caused the death because it was the tetrahydrazoline that was so significant that that level was fatal. You were asked to make a lot of assumptions about perhaps Ms. Hernan's character, I guess, in the fact that the baclofen and cyclobenzaprine were even there, right? Because she had been told to stop taking those. They shouldn't have been there. They shouldn't have been there, you kept being told. They shouldn't have been there. The tetrahydrazoline shouldn't have been there at all because if she was using it as eye drops, it would have been under one. The level would have been under 0. Under 1.0. The reason Ms. Hernan wasn't taking baclofen and cyclobenzaprine is because she herself reported having side effects she didn't like. And they were not life-threatening side effects. They were rashes. They were salt in her mouth. They were weight gain. When you think about all of the counts in this case, you're going to have to think about who Ms. Hernan was. And I want you to think about the different sources of information that you've received during this trial about Ms. Hernan. And consider the sources of that information. You heard in this case from three of Ms. Hernan's closest friends, people that she loved, Anthony Poza told you he would go over there and she'd make him lunch during college and they'd talk about movies, black and white movies. They'd talk about her dad, who was in the military. Corrine Poza showed you birthday cards that she still had from Ms. Hernan. She was a very thoughtful person. She liked to cook. You heard that she would bring food to parties. Corrine Poza told you that they had an affinity for shoes together, and she laughed a little when she looked at that note on one of the birthday cards. Corrine Poza told you that she had gone thrift shopping and rummaging with Ms. Hernan because she loved to get a deal. Ms. Hernan was making plans with these people. Jim Kelleher told you they were making plans because he still had a birthday gift for her after she got out of the hospital. Anthony Poza and Keith Lang saw Ms. Hernan, after they had had lunch and she made plans to see Anthony soon. Ms. Hernan was always thoughtful about her appearance, and that's significant. She gave gifts that were meaningful, not necessarily expensive. She was overall, as we've seen in the patterns presented, frugal. She had a very high credit score. She paid cards down. She didn't spend a ton of money. She certainly was not someone who used technology very well. In fact, Ms. Poza told you that when she'd have photos of Anthony, Ms. Hernan would want her to physically send those to get printed so she could pick them up. She could not even manipulate the photo application on a smartphone, let alone some of the other things that she's been alleged to have been involved with in this case. She loved her pet, her pets. And you heard even from the insurance agent, she was a thoughtful person making Christmas gifts of food, low cost items. That is in great juxtaposition with how Ms. Hernan's been portrayed in this trial. You heard over and over that she was angry. She was so angry, she was giving up. She wanted to get rid of all of her money for some unknown reason. She wanted to have no more liquidity at the time of her death. She was suicidal. How many times did you hear these things about Ms. Hernan? And the suggestion that she was apparently scamming the government because she got food share. 
hiding assets from the government to accept government assistance. I want you to think about the sources of this, these kind of attributes for Ms. Hernan. Because ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to have to make credibility determinations in this case. And you have to consider what intent the source of information had. Was it to mislead you? Was it to shift your focus? What's the motive behind those kind of statements? You need to consider that when you're deciding about intent. Because at the core of this case really is the defendant's intent and the lack of consent for those theft counts. And those are all questions that Ms. Hernan can't answer because she was murdered. That's why these questions have to be answered with circumstantial evidence. And that includes motive, which is different from intent. But it's someone's reason for doing something. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that in this case, Ms. Kraszewski's intent is clear. It was to kill. The intent behind her lies is to mislead. And the motive is her own personal benefit, whether it be getting out of trouble or money. Count two is the theft while Ms. Hernan was alive. Again, these two things Ms. Hernan can't tell you about, so we rely on the circumstances. One significant one is the difference in the patterns that you saw between Ms. Hernan and Ms. Kraszewski in this case. There was testimony about this and information gleaned from all of the financial records about these. Ms. Hernan was paying cards down. She had a great credit score. She wasn't using a ton of ATMs. She wasn't <clears throat> lavishly spending, right? You heard that she bought herself a vehicle and some jewelry, but really other than that, she's, she's not going on vacations, she's not buying computers and iPads and things, televisions, and she's spending her money in Waukesha County in person, not online. You saw the patterns of Ms. Kraszewski in this case. The credit cards are close to their max, there's a lot of ATM and cash, cash advances. That, the spending is happening at places where Ms. Kraszewski can get cash out and gamble. Whether it be a casino or a bar, there's been testimony in this case that Ms. Kraszewski spent significant sums of money on slot machines. In the geographic area where she lived, and additionally, using a lot of online activity. You were shown this credit score comparison, and you'll see that when Ms. Hernan's score plummets is the same time that all those credit card accounts are maxing out, becoming due. No payments are being made on loans. Her score plummets in the last three or four months before her death. And ladies and gentlemen, the financial aspect of this case and the investigation even was very complex. It took a lot of time. There were a lot of records. There were a lot of things that needed to be put out in a, in a timeline or, or pattern so that we could understand it. It was not a simple review. I submit to you that that was exactly Ms. Kraszewski's intent. The intent to mislead and the motive for financial gain. We focused on these accounts, the top three belonging to Ms. Hernan and the bottom two belonging to the defendant. And we talked about the theft coming out of Lynn's accounts and going into the defendant's accounts. That money market account was the big account that there was 250 grand in, right? That was an account that Ms. Hernan didn't pay bills from. She didn't write a check to, 
you know, we energies from the money market account. And Detective Plentis told you why that was. Because there's penalties on an account like that for too many transactions. So what you saw happening as a pattern was that Ms. Hernan would move money from the money market account into her own checking account where she'd pay bills. The only checks written from this account, aside from one, go to the defendant. No one else is getting thousands of dollars from this account. There's memo lines shown along the right side. I submit to you that the intent behind those memo lines is to mislead. Because that's not what this, these funds were used for. We painstakingly went through Ms. Kershewski's spending habits. There was no IRS payment. She got a tax return that year. There were no doctor bills for procedures, endoscopy procedures. There was not huge sums of money going to car payments. There were thousands and thousands of dollars a month spent at Stalis Palace. That's what you saw on the defendant's finances. A bank account that held $250,000 less than two years later had $87 and change in it. And $134,000 plus of that money went to the defendant in the form of 20 <coughs> checks. The last two entries on here were electronic checks, both written October 1st of 2018, two days before Ms. Hernan dies. And I say written, but they really weren't written, were they? Because they're electronic. This is internet check. What's the top one for? $5,000 to the defendant. And the bottom one is a check that went directly to the defendant's mom's apartment complex. These funds came out of the BMO money market account. These checks were made online. On the same day these checks were written, the defendant, who never had a BMO account of her own, downloads the BMO Harris mobile banking app. Lynn Hernan was not creating electronic checks two days before she died on the internet. <coughs> the other main account of Ms. Hernan's was her checking account, the 5336 account. And during the trial, we focused a lot on the checks written from the money market account and this checking account. But there were also expenditures that we didn't include uh, in the total, including over four grand spent on her check card while she was in the hospital. $4,000. She was only in the hospital from September 15th through the 28th. Whose spending pattern does four grand in two weeks sound like? There was over three grand of transactions after Ms. Hernan's death. We know that she wasn't using her check card. And ultimately, of all the checks that Ms. Hernan wrote from her checking account, included paying bills, and over $10,000 in checks to the defendant. It's very telling when you look at two of those checks from Ms. Hernan's checking account. Ms. Hernan certainly knew how to give a gift if she wanted to. When Anthony graduated high school, Ms. Hernan's intent was to give him $200. So she wrote a check and in the memo line, it says graduation. <clears throat> There's one other check in the form of a gift from this checking account. It's to Ms. Kershewski. The memo line says gift. Look at the value of that check. 
$2,612.17 for a gift. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Kraszewski is the only person in Ms. Hernan's life getting gifts like that. There is absolutely nothing in this record for you to conclude that people like Anthony stopped caring about Ms. Hernan or that she stopped caring about him. Absolutely nothing. This makes no sense because the date of the 2,600 bucks that Ms. Kershewski got was July 22nd of 16. She didn't graduate from high school that day. She didn't get married. She didn't have a baby. Jeff, to information that's not in the record, Judge. Um, overall. That check is not to celebrate a monumental part of Ms. Kraszewski's life, like the $200 that Anthony got when he graduated. When you add up these checks, you get that total that we talked about before. And ladies and gentlemen, that was Ms. Kraszewski's primary source of income. Right? You saw her paychecks over the span of almost two years total less than 50 grand. Her income was stealing from Ms. Hernan. And she never paid a dime of it back. <coughs> This total of over $144,000 does not take into account several other pieces that are very suspicious in this case and give another piece of circumstantial evidence for you when you consider, is this really what Lynn wanted? In February of 2018, a loan is applied for for 30 grand is what ultimately gets approved. At that point in time, Ms. Hernan is not in some sort of dire financial situation. She's not trying to buy a home. There's absolutely no reason gleaned from Ms. Hernan's financial accounts that she would need this kind of a loan in February of 2018. I submit to you that the way that this loan was applied for, that's not something that Ms. Hernan was capable of doing, frankly. Because these documents on the left, this kitten check, I've highlighted the last four of the account number on the bottom of that check. That was given to Goldman Sachs to say, here's the account we want this money to go in, right? It has Lynn Hernan's name on it, but that's the defendant's account. The 8149 account did not have Lynn Hernan on it when this application was made. And what that means to you, ladies and gentlemen, is that that is fraud. It's not real. That check is not real. What else isn't real that Goldman Sachs received? We went through painstaking detail about the different uh, financial banking support documents that that um, loan provider received. Again, they're fraud. They are fraudulent. Someone who knows how to create documents and manipulate information turned the bank account information of herself to look like it was Ms. Hernan's. The information that Marcus Goldman Sachs was given during this application process includes that phone number that we've talked about, 262-421-5290. <coughs> Detectives told you that is not a number that Lynn Hernan used. We know one person that used that number, and it was the defendant who gave it over the phone to a bank when she was pretending to be Lynn Hernan. 
The intent behind this is to mislead. The motive is financial gain. Ms. Kershewski has to then add Lynn Hernan to this account before the money is dispersed because the loan is in Lynn Hernan's name. So the money gets put in to Jesse Kershewski's account on March 8th of 2018, $30,000. And this was all done online. Ladies and gentlemen, Lynn Hernan knew how to give gifts if she wanted to give gifts. There are such more simple ways of transferring money to someone than this. And that circumstance goes directly to consent. That loan ultimately has some payments made from the estate account. Right? Goldman Sachs is saying there's minimum payments due on this loan. The defendant pays three times out of the Tri-City account, all the while having never listed that $30,000 loan on the final accounting. <coughs> Ms. Kershewski never discloses it. She never pays it. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that's because her intent was to mislead and her motive was for financial gain. We know Ms. Kershewski is accessing these accounts without Ms. Hernan because this call placed near Ms. Kershewski's mom's house is a call to the bank. If we could play that, please. Thank you for calling uh, City. My name's Melanie. Can I have your name as it appears on your card? Lynn A. Hernan. This is another circumstance for you to consider when you're trying to determine whether all of this financial activity was done with Ms. Hernan's consent. If she's with Ms. Hernan and Ms. Hernan wants her to have all this money, why do you have to pretend to be her on the phone? There's evidence in this record that Ms. Hernan knew how to make a call to make a transfer of funds to talk to her bank on the phone. There's absolutely no logical reason why Ms. Kraszewski would have to call any of these banks and pretend to be Ms. Hernan. The intent was to mislead and the motive was for financial gain. And that's why all of Ms. Kraszewski's information is on the victim's credit report, which the defense showed you. Exhibit 621, Ms. Kershewski's P.O. box, her phone number, and the 5290 number are all on here. Another circumstance for you to consider in terms of whether this was all with consent, Ms. Kershewski gave a pretty detailed account of what she and Ms. Hernan did on October 3rd of 2018, multiple times in those interviews. And when you look at these, it's actually quite morbid. Miss Hernan is either being poisoned, dying, or dead. And Jennifer Flower gets a new 75-inch TV and an Apple Watch on Miss Hernan's dime. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that Lynn Hernan did not have the desire to have a JCPenney credit card opened up the day she died. Most or all of these things happening online, which Ms. Hernan also didn't do. At this point in time, the money market is depleted, the checking account is depleted, and the credit cards are maxed out. But there's still money for Ms. Kershewski after Ms. Hernan is dead. Because when Ms. Hernan dies, Ms. Kershewski then files for the informal administration in the probate estate. Her and Anthony Poza 
are the beneficiaries, and immediately, Anthony told you that it was odd how quickly Ms. Kroszewski told him, you have to sign off on, on this stuff so we can get the estate going. And after that point in time, ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that the Tri-City Estate account became Ms. Kroszewski's source of income. Over $50,000 in cash went from that account into Ms. Kroszewski's pocket. It was not going to creditors. And when Anthony realized how, just how much money had already come out of that estate and asked some questions about it, we have a series of fraud handed from Ms. Kroszewski to Anthony Poza. The intent to mislead. The motive, financial gain. 52 pieces of paper Anthony Poza got from Jesse Kroszewski. Here's 17 of them. Fake, they're fake. The vet clinic administrator came in here and told you that's not correct. And not only was this created so that Ms. Kroszewski could pocket an extra $100, but the cats put down and their name got deleted from, for no reason. Fake. Fake, fake, fake. Serve pro bill, fake. Detective Plinus painstakingly went through these documents and showed you that they're all fraud created by someone who is very good at making fraudulent documents look correct. Mr. Poza thought, well, okay. And this is, you saw this through the handwriting expert. There's the Jeep title. Fake. Debt's a decedent. Fake. These numbers don't even match the numbers that she tried to give Anthony Poza. And the will. Fake. Ms. Kroszewski knew that she had to create some reason why she had taken 50 grand out of the estate account. Why she had spent another 15 plus in payments out toward other accounts. You heard testimony that there's one person involved in this case who has previously used fraud, used a mechanism to mislead for financial gain. Two different times back in 2010. You can consider those for Ms. Kroszewski's intent and motive in this case. And I submit to you that it's very clear her intent is to mislead, and her motive is for financial gain. Ms. Kroszewski has a pattern of making things up to get herself out of trouble. Attorney Taylor testified that when she got involved, Ms. Kroszewski got removed as the personal representative. Ms. Kroszewski's backed into a corner at that point, right? She's not in charge of this anymore. So what does she do? What does she do to try to get herself out of hot water? She files with the circuit court this new will that removes Anthony with some, Attorney Taylor told you, very odd explanation that the first will was some sort of a test that then Anthony failed. She's never heard of that in her life because it's ridiculous. And the loan, the loan alone of $18,700 meets your value criteria on count three. Not even considering the cash or payments that were made from the Tri-City account to the defendant's own debts. None of that inheritance loan funding 
is valid. That is theft. Ladies and gentlemen, you were told that personal rep representatives have a fiduciary duty to act in the best interests of the estate, not themselves. Not themselves. The estate was the rightful owner of the money at the time of this theft. And as one of the beneficiaries, Anthony Poza is listed as a victim on the count three. None of that $87,000 went back into this estate account. There is an intent to permanently deprive. Ms. Kraszewski didn't pay any of it back. And ultimately, Mr. Poza receives a check for 13 grand, which was half of what's left after Ms. Kraszewski stole from it. Again, you can't read someone's mind to determine intent. But the case comes down to intent, all three charges, right? Because Ms. Kraszewski says, I didn't steal from Ms. Hernan and I didn't kill her. But this is again where you're gonna have to make some credibility determinations in the face of so much circumstantial evidence. Because ladies and gentlemen, lies are very tricky to keep track of. <coughs> The truth is very simple. And in this case, we've shown that Ms. Kraszewski lies when it will benefit her. When she's in hot water, she lies. Ms. Kraszewski compartmentalizes people in her life to keep them all from the truth of what's actually happening. And the intent behind this is to mislead them. And the motive is her own personal gain. Throughout this case, the question of whether Ms. Hernan was suicidal changes multiple times. On day one, on October 3rd of 2018, Ms. Kraszewski is not telling any EMS worker or deputy, oh my gosh, she's been drinking by Zine, she had a gun once, she's been trying to kill herself, I can't believe this happened. No, she's asked. Point blank, was Ms. Hearn suicidal? And the answer is yes and no. But after this date, what do we know about Ms. Kraszewski? She's very interested in what the medical examiner knows and what the sheriff's department knows because she's calling. What's in the toxicology? Do we have the toxicology back yet? Until they finally tell her, we can't talk to you anymore. So she comes in and talks to detectives. This entire discussion on Ms. Kraszewski's point is to mislead them. She's not going to reveal she poisoned Ms. Hernan with tetrahydrazoline because she doesn't know they found it yet. She doesn't know that anybody knows what she did yet. So she's not going to bring it up, just like she didn't bring it up on the day it happened. Maybe they won't find it. Then we have the star. July 9th of 2019, when Ms. Kraszewski is finally told this. Um, I'll be honest, there's been three times that she said, I want to give up. Yeah. I don't want to do this anymore. And she always said, the day when it comes, I want your help. The day when it comes, I want your help. I said, I'm not helping you do anything. When it comes to pills or messing around with anything, that's, I'm not looking for trouble. I'm not trying to get in trouble. But she She's said, a like full-grown adult. Like her doctor from work. So that's a pretty different story than that. As soon as she knows the gig's up, well, okay, three times she said she wanted to give up. Ms. Kraszewski is constantly considering the new information that she's getting and altering her story in a way that benefits her. The next day, she wants to talk to law enforcement. I want you to remember that. All of these interviews are because Ms. Kraszewski thought about things overnight and wanted to give more information the next day. So the next day, the question, <clears throat> the question of was Lynn suicidal changes again. Because she was trying to find an easy way out. She, was trying, she, was trying she to did the pills first numerous times that wasn't working. So she was trying to kill herself yeah. by drinking Vizina and Vodka. She also bought a gun offline when that I disposed of for her before she died too. When? 
I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that Ms. Kershevsky knew, well, they found it in the toxicology now. I have to say she was suicidal and that she drank it on her own to keep myself out of trouble. The intent behind all of this is to mislead, and the motive is to keep herself out of trouble. These focus over here, she bought these guns, right? Misleading the investigators. There's these guns, she bought them. I, I wrestled one away from Ms. Hernan once. Okay, well, Ms. Kraszewski is really the person, based on the evidence, that acquired those items. The Brownell firearm, here's the phone call. Hey, I wanna change the delivery from a residence to a FedEx pickup. That phone call is made from Ms. Kraszewski's phone near her house. And this is all in order placed on Ms. Hernan's credit card. This one's even more telling because what do we know about September 27th of 2018? Lynn Hernan is at Waukesha Memorial Hospital, which is nowhere near the map that you're being shown from Exhibit 173. This is a phone call to Urban Arms, another order using victim's credit card. She's in the hospital, and the order is made on Ms. Kraszewski's phone. That's all nonsense. It's all an effort to mislead. Because in reality, Ms. Kraszewski's story changes iterations based on the amount of information that she has. And the only things that never change are things that only Lynn could correct. That she was suicidal and that she wanted to give all of her money away. I'll say again, credibility is a huge task for you in this case. And when we talk about someone's credibility, um, you've seen firsthand things that Ms. Kraszewski has no problem lying about. Dan Radloff sat up there and told you that she would pretend to go to work when he was living with her. She would get up, get ready, and pretend like she had a job. Later saying, yeah, no, I, I don't actually, I'm not actually working. Up to big lies like a lie to a family she lived with. Why did the Craig family think Lynn Hernan was in a coma at Freighter? This is why, because Ms. Kraszewski told that to Scott Craig. And remember why this comes up. In May of 2018, what's going on in Ms. Kraszewski's life that makes this lie something that's going to personally gain she's gonna gain from. The scenario is that Scott wants nothing to do with her anymore. And it's all an attempt to mislead, to shift your focus. Scott, forget about that and look over here. Lynn Hernan's in a coma. She was never in a coma at Freighter Hospital and Ms. Kraszewski never told Scott Craig that. The detectives told Scott Craig that. The motive is to get herself out of hot water. And nonetheless, she lies about telling them that. So I'd be held by her. Again, this is the guy who swears he's told me she was in a coma. No. Why do you never said that, swear to God. <laughs> why do you think he's so upset? This is someone that she was closest with. She lived with. Scott Craig was also someone in Ms. Kraszewski's life that had to stay very compartmentalized. It is no coincidence that he never met Lynn Hernan, ladies and gentlemen. It is no coincidence that Scott Craig was not invited to the funeral dinner for Lynn Hernan, where Scott may have been able to talk with an Anthony Poza or a Keith Lang or a Kareen Poza. So sad about Lynn being in a coma at Freighter.
Can you imagine if Scott would have said that at the dinner? No way. This was something that was so significant because he had no idea. Ms. Kershevsky was very, very good at misleading Mr. Craig. And he expresses the frustration and shock in this call that you heard from State's Exhibit 54. I was told she's in the hospital. You said what? In the hospital. hospital, numerous times. Well, not in a coma for five months. That's what you told me. I know that's what I told you. Yeah, I told I you know. that to protect that's you really for disgusting. a reason. I told you that to protect you for a reason. That makes no sense, ladies and gentlemen. Another consideration in your credibility <clears throat> determination of the defendant in this case should be this January 2019 discussion, which happens up here on our timeline, well before the star. What is going on on this day in January of 2019? Do you recall the beginning of this discussion? Scott Craig's mad at her. She's in, she's in hot water again, right? However, that disagreement evaporates once she says this. Tetrahydrazoline in my blood. Detective Cole couldn't even pronounce the word tetrahydrazoline. And Jesse Krzyzewski is spelling it out in a text message, pretending to be at the hospital. She obviously goes on to ever deny saying this in 2019. And then changes that story to, okay, it was a friend, and then changes that story to, okay, I actually drank it, but no one was really poisoned. But the main point that you need to consider, which bears on intent, is that in Ms. Kershevsky's own statement, she knows exactly how serious tetrahydrazoline is. And she's right about that. Because you heard testimony in this case that when used for nefarious purposes, perpetrators select tetrahydrazoline because it impairs memory, impairs judgment, reduces inhibition, produces a period of unconsciousness. It's not routinely detected, and it's available. Nonetheless, six months later, when Ms. Krzyzewski is told, this is her response. I get it. Um, and there's an anomaly in her toxicology. There's a drug in her system that's not supposed to be there. What would that be? Um, it's called tetrahydrazine. What is that? Oh, commonly known as eye drops. Hmm. hmm. This is six, six months have gone by. So now she knows. What does she say about whether Ms. Hernan was using it? A lot. Like an odd enough, you can't take it through your eyes. It has to be ingested through, through oral ways. I've never seen her drink it, ever, ever. And why would you drink eye drops? I mean, what would it taste like? I don't even know, but. Not, oh my gosh, I've been buying bottles of this stuff for her because she drinks it all the time and I've seen her drink it. No, it's say it like that because it doesn't sound right. But I didn't give her anything. I didn't even give her her pills wrong or vodka or draw. I didn't give her anything. I didn't give her this eye drop. Then we have a period of time where Miss Kershevsky is thinking, and the next morning she says, "I want to talk again." Right. This is the next day. I've gotten the visine for her. I never put any in her anything for her. Ever. Ever. Never. 
I bought it for her. That's as far as I've gotten. I've never even put in her eyes for her. I submit to you that the intent behind this is to mislead, and the motive is to get herself out of trouble. Or this would have been something she said on day one. And she was drinking vodka and Visine. Now, how, how do you know she was drinking vodka and Visine? Because that's what she had mixed together. And that was the day before. How do you know she had mixed Visine with her, with her vodka? Because that's what she did. There's still some distance there, right? That was the day before. Again, there's a night that goes by. Ms. Kurczewski is thinking. And the next morning on the 11th, I want to talk again. I've got more information. <clears throat> she did. She, one time, the whole time I've known her, she drank one bottle in front of me. Just one time. One bottle. And she never did that after it. I was so upset and hurt by it because... I don't, I, I didn't want her to do this. I didn't think it was the best way to go. She was trying everything. Two days ago, this person is saying, I've never seen her drink it ever, ever. And now she's drinking a whole bottle of it in front of her. This is the same day. The water didn't taste like anything in the vodka. She liked it because she got like a little more of a buzz off of it. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, not one doctor or expert told you that that is factual at all. Dr. Thomas testified that she is unaware of anything that would suggest people are drinking tetrahydrazoline because of some euphoric or buzz. Dr. Bedritsky said the same thing. Even Dr. Spiller said. That's not a symptom or side effect of drinking tetrahydrazoline. Again, the intent is to mislead. Knowing she wants it. Once I put in two drops for her. Okay. Once. In what? In her vodka. Okay. And how, once was how long before that? That was a month and a No. Probably four weeks. Three, four weeks before. That was the only time I ever did it. Ladies and gentlemen, when you determine credibility, you have to consider whether the source of the information has an interest in the outcome. This is the last version that you're left with. Oh, that bottle of water right there had in six, six vitamins. How do, you know? How do you know that? Because that's what she put in it. When? She told me, the three days before I threw it out. And she asked for it that morning. Did you gave it to her? Gave it to her. Yeah. I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, can you even rely on that? Credibility is again questioned as we begin this wild goose chase. On July 12th, there's the first little piece of information about things that are hidden away. And before you even dive into this, I want you just to think, why in the world would someone hide these types of items? Nonetheless, it starts with the BMO lockbox. Okay. That's what I'd like. Okay. Check her BMS Harris. Her BMO, BMO Harris Bank. Okay. She has black box. I thought you said this was a storage shed. That's where she put her items. No. And this is a BMO Harris black box now. Correct. I didn't give any specifics for a reason. You said a storage shed. I said it's not in my name. So in a lock box, BMO there box. is a, a gun. No. There is. Where is the gun? I said she has her stuff and I have my stuff. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, on July 12th, when Ms. Kershevsky tells Aaron Hoppy to look in that BMO lockbox, she absolutely knows it's empty. Because she was the last one there with her mom the day after Lynn Hernan died. 
And in April of 2019, before these interviews, she surrenders that box, signing that there's nothing in it. Shift the focus. Look at things that don't matter. She has a new layer to this whole story then. Tell us where you bury this stuff. No, I'll tell you. Where'd you bury it? <laughs> it's in Whitnell Park. Whitnell Park? That's where my bunny used to be buried. It's behind my mom's apartment. Again, why, instead of, so in theory there, instead of telling anyone what happened, I'm going to keep it quiet and I'm going to save some of this stuff in case Lynn Hernan does die and then after she's died and, and I've lied about how she died, I'll have it buried. You, you can't even connect it in a, in a logical way if you try. Wait does get muddy and swampy certain times of the year. It wasn't when I went. Um, I did this literally before she even passed. So, and it was all together in three Ziploc bags. Or is it in a box or anything? Nope. Or it's just three, three Ziploc bags. Three Ziploc I just bags. kept Ziploc bagging it and then the freezer bags. And how far down? I would say about four to five feet. Four to five feet? Yep. Are you, are you kidding me? Maybe four? I don't know. I guess. Four feet? Hold on. <laughs> you understand you're just that. over four feet. Okay, like this. What is this? I'm not good okay, with that. Okay, that means two. Okay, hold on. Four feet. Yeah, you're right. That is the question. Can anyone stop? If you give me more of my body in there or something. I'm one of those people sometimes, like, I'm better, like, I have ropes. Like, I can tell you ropes, but I can show you. Yeah, I guess that's true. I'm fine with that. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Kraszewski is not stupid. She knows the difference between five feet and 18 inches. But Detective Hoppy wasn't buying it, so the story changes. Law enforcement attempts to find these things every time she says they exist. Metal detectors and detectives out in parks looking for rocks over, over burial sites. Her initial claim of a storage shed somewhere comes up again on the 16th. The storage shed, Justin. I know there's a storage there shed. There isn't, I swear to God, there's not a storage shed. I, I put down everything. I just said that because I thought by saying that that would help me get out. I swear to you on everything. She thought it'd help her get out of trouble. That's why she said that. Ladies and gentlemen, the reality of Jesse Krzyzewski looks a lot different than this person in Exhibit 206 crying about a lost burial site. The reality of this person, her acts, words, and statements, is that she is accessing documents about criminal poisoning in July of 2018 and deleting them in February of 2018. Sorry, 2019. Household poisons. Arsenic trioxide. Ladies and gentlemen, what else do we know happened right around February of 2019 in this case? <clears throat> right in here. The medical examiner wouldn't talk to her anymore. The reality of this case, ladies and gentlemen, is that this is someone with a fair amount of poison research on her own phone. This is someone who has profited over $144,000 before death and over $80,000 after. This is someone who misleads others when she's in hot water. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that Ms. Krzyzewski thought she would get away with this or be able to talk her way out of it. But the reality of this is that the cause of death is a poisoning, and the manner of death is a homicide. 
At the time Lynn Hernan died, she was worth more to Ms. Kraszewski dead than alive. And this person that you heard about, this loving person on the left, did not kill herself. Based on all the facts and evidence that you've seen, the state is going to ask that you return three verdicts of guilty in this case. Thank you. All right, thank you. At this time, I'm going to give everyone just a short break, about 10, 15 minutes. If you need a little longer, that's fine as well. And we'll come back for the uh, defense closing arguments. I'll rise for the jury, please. All right, we're in recess. Thank you.
they would anything in. Can you check to make sure the boards don't block any table view from the jury? You shouldn't block anyone. Um, no, yeah. I don't think it does, but I'll, I'll double check. Yeah, I don't know if the state wants to check too. I just want to make sure that everyone in the jury box can see both tables with those large. I'm more concerned probably about the end. Yep. <clears throat> Not fair. Yeah, right. sure. um, yes, I can see. Yep. It's good. Tables. to a different floor for some of them. So I think we're, they're all back and we'll bring them up shortly. Okay, let's go back on the record then. Appearances are as they were before. Just uh, before I bring the jury out, I had another thought related to 28. I can do one of two things is excuse him and then he would not have to stay with the others or keep him. I don't know that I've ever been in a situation where I've actually needed the alternates, but you never know. Does either party have a preference on that? No. Attorney Kukler? I mean, no, not really. Whatever the court wants to do. Then I'll probably excuse him and I'll let him know. No, I'm thinking about it. Then that would look like it's different than the other jurors. If one is excused and the other two aren't, it looks like there's some kind of differentiation. Well, I would do that on the record in front of everyone and just tell him. But otherwise, no. That's fine. We'll keep them. Okay. Whatever you want. <clears throat> I think we should keep them. Okay. Then that's what we'll do. All right, Madam Clerk. That's a good point, so...
Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. And then, Attorney Kukler, when you are ready, you may begin. Good morning. <clears throat> Get my screen up. Ladies and gentlemen, this case is uh, this case is not a homicide. The state has not proven a first degree intentional homicide. It's what everyone concluded on October 3rd, 2018. It was a suicide. And everyone who came to the scene on that day concluded it was a suicide. And they concluded it for a lot of reasons, including what you saw, which is a whole boatload of prescriptions that were laying around. Lynn was hoarded pills, and they were everywhere. Pills that were uh, no longer prescribed to her. And the pills were found in her system. She took all those pills. And they also, when the medical examiner did the evaluation of the stomach contents, pills were in there. It's a, what is called a polydrug overdose. When somebody takes too many pills, the com combination together creates, can create exactly what happened here. That is Lynn's death. And Dr. Thomas, when she was here, she said there was strong evidence. Uh, let me see what I've got. This is the prescription medications in the living room. And I don't want to forget about what was seen it was at the scene. Remember, people who were there that day weren't looking for eye drops. That wasn't on their mind. So there, the suggestion that there were no eye drops is not true. It's not proven by a fact. It's just an opinion. And when the people came in and testified, uh, law enforcement, they agreed with us that they weren't looking for them. And Dr. B agreed 100% eventually that there was, was a bottle of eye drops, LB not the ones with tetrahydrosoline, the ones that she would use in her actual eyes, on the table next to her. But if you remember at the beginning of the case when the state was asking witness after witness, were there eye drops there, were there eye drops there, were there eye drops there, the answer was always no. But it wasn't true. And what was surprising is that even after Dr. B agreed that we had found the right, uh, the right bottle of um, eye drops that were on the table that Detective Hoppy, when he got on the stand and he sat through this entire trial, still couldn't agree that there were eye drops at the scene, even though it had been uh, testified to by the state. But it's similar to the deputy medical examiner when she looked and she saw the kitchen wastebasket full of liquor bottles. Nobody took any pictures of liquor bottles. She said she saw it, she put it in her report, but nobody in law enforcement ever bothered to photograph it. That doesn't mean they weren't there. That we know was there because she saw them and put it in a report. Otherwise, they would be here today also arguing that there was no sign of any liquor. They weren't looking for it. But they noticed things that were all consistent with, with uh, a suicide. There's the bottle of eye drops. Dr. B identified it. We brought in the bottle. Those are eye drops. It wasn't collected. So the state says that they collected all this boatload of stuff. Well, what, how about that one bottle that was right there on the table next to bottles of pills? Of all the things you wouldn't collect, why wouldn't you collect that? to make it, it suggest that they weren't there. Thank goodness for one picture where we can find it. Because it wasn't collected doesn't mean it wasn't there. Because Visine or other types of uh, eye drops that also have tetrahydrosoline in them, and there's any number of them, you saw them as exhibits during the trial, just because they were not collected or noted doesn't mean they weren't there. She had tetrahydrosoline in her system. 
Now, Lynn had water bottles. There's one. We can see caps for two water bottles. We don't even know where the other water bottle is. Again, not collected. Certainly, these things should have been collected, should have been available to be analyzed. You're going to charge somebody with the first degree intentional homicide, and yet you don't have the evidence to be able to test it, to look at it, to evaluate it. Sorry. Everyone at the scene concluded it was a suicide, ladies and gentlemen. It, it was a suicide. It looked like a suicide. For Dr. B to say a year later that the scene looked staged, how, how, can, how can we wrap our heads around that? If the scene looked staged, then on October 4th of 2018, when she did the autopsy, she should have been right out of the gate. Look at this scene. It looks staged. Because part of her autopsy, right, it was to look at all these photographs that had been taken at, at the scene by her deputy medical examiner. And the facts and circumstances, look at Lynn's body, look at how it was positioned, the, the, the drugs that she had spilled on herself. She saw all that on October 4th of 2018. She had a body next to her to compare the body that's next to her with what was fresh evidence. Hey, law enforcement, this looks staged. I want you to rush over to that home. I want you to go look to see what else you can find because I don't think this is a suicide. She didn't do that because it didn't look staged because it wasn't staged. And the suggestion that these, the, that these fragments uh, or powder pills that Lynn was obviously using to be able to take the drugs she decided to take, that because they were spilled in such a way it's staged. No. Dr. Thomas explained, it's much like eating, a, eating anything that has, that has crumbs, right? Whether it's a powdered sugar donut or something else that you're eating and you've got crumbs, they spill mm -hmm. on you. And there's no way to say that way the body was on, um, at the scene that, that there was no jostling or movement of that body between there and getting it to the medical examiner's office, because of course there was. Dr. Thomas done more than 5,000 5, autopsies. She's so very experienced at this. Said so they're always going to be jostling of the body. From pulling her out of the chair to putting her uh, on, a, on a gurney, to putting it, the body in a body bag, to taking it in the car back to the medical examiner's office, and all the things they have to do, of course the body was juggled and jostled. Now when we were, when the medical, well, in the trial, with the plain view eye drops that were never gathered, that we established in trial, that nobody ever noticed because remember too, Dr. B, when she first testified, said there was no evidence of it at the scene. It's only when we saw it that anybody else saw it. If you're not looking for it, <clears throat> you don't see it. We learned though that in her belly, we learned through Henry Spiller, didn't we, that in her belly was a teaspoon of Visine, one <coughs> teaspoon of Visine. And we looked at a bottle of Visine, and we learned that a teaspoon is about a third of a bottle. That's how much was in her belly. Dr. Thomas looked at the scene and that's what, you see, that's what, um, when you get a second opinion on a cause of death and a manner of death, what the, what the second pathologist does is really take a look with fresh eyes at everything, everything. And what she looked at were the same things 
that the that Dr. B looked at. No, she didn't have the body in front of her, but there's nothing about having the physical body in front of her, of Dr. B, that led to any conclusion that, that Lynn died of tetrahydrazoline poisoning. But what she does have is the benefit of all the scene photos, all the autopsy photos, which we didn't show you, but there's, there's dozens and dozens of them as the medical examiner is doing her evaluation. She takes a picture of everything along the way. So then if there is a second uh, evaluation done, the second pathologist can see what she saw with her eyes. She also had the slides. She also reviewed the slides. She also has the toxicology and the reports and the medical records. She had all of that. And she told you that it is undetermined, but strong support for suicide or even an accident, which can happen. Somebody takes too many pills, the wrong combination, can accidentally die too. As far as it being staged, this is what law enforcement said. Oops, just a minute. I don't know if we don't have volume for some reason. Plate and spoon away from her, but I've also brought back to her because there were certain pills she couldn't swallow. Physically, she couldn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'd sit there and they'd come back up. Sit there and they come back. So, I mean, I went, it went both ways. As far as the pills she crushed, I mean, I didn't sit there and let her crush 20 pills in my presence. You know, I let her, the, the main few that she always did. Usually if I come back, there'd be more or different ones or, you know, you can tell by looking at a plate. You know, obviously if they're all white, you can't tell. But, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm telling you, I know when I left every day and I'd come back and the pill amounts aren't what they should be. And then she always kept pills on the side of her that weren't, that she didn't take anymore. And those were suddenly getting put up on the table. And she'd, oh, I, I grab those by mistake. You know, she'd make up stuff. And she'd act like she didn't, you know, like, oh, I didn't put those there. Or Lid crushed her pills. And Jean Tunnell, the neighbor mm -hmm. who the defense called in, said that when she would see Lynn, she was usually drinking uh, two, bo oops, two bottles uh, of water and she told law enforcement back then, despite what she might have remembered in court four or five years later, or five years later, at the time that she was interviewed by law enforcement, she told them that Lynn was suicidal and alcoholic and that Lynn wasn't nice when she was drinking. Of course Lynn was nice many times. Of course, Jesse had a very good relationship with Lynn, and other people at times did, but when Lynn was <clears throat> drinking a lot or maybe using a lot of drugs, she wasn't a, ni a nice person to be around, and Jean, Jean said that. And the alcoholism is supported by the medical records. Remember, she had the signs of alcoholism that were seen by Dr. B and testified to by Dr. Thomas. It was there. That's a fact. And, and remember Lynn being found at the scene. She's got expensive bracelets on, and there's water bottles around that presumably the state's theory is Jesse was trying to kill her with THC in the water bottles. If you're going to do that, um, why would you, one, leave expensive bracelets on her? Why would you take those expensive bracelets off of her, right? Why would you leave them? And why would you leave the water bottles? Like any more than if you shot somebody with a gun, would you leave the gun? I don't think so. You wouldn't leave it behind. And would you keep calling the medical examiner for answers? So yeah, Jesse knew that Lynn would take THC, take Visine, drink it, but she had a but, it, but she doesn't know how she died that day. Looked like a suicide with pills from a person who was unhappy. She kept calling the medical examiner, and the only reason 
um, medical examiner stopped talking to her or their office. It wasn't because they said, we don't want to talk to her anymore. It's because the detective put a hold on it and said, don't talk to anybody anymore. That's the reason that happened. And Gary Verdon was here in court. He told you, didn't he, that he, and that was a friend of Jenny's. Sure, it's a friend. But he saw Visine from the get-go. He saw it in her garbage cans on the occasions that he was at her house. And you know what? If he was going to lie to you, he's under oath like everyone else. He's an honest person on the witness stand. I didn't detect any, anything from him that struck me as dishonest. Objection. If he's going to lie, <coughs> why not go all the way <coughs> and say, hey, I saw her drinking Visine. If you wanted to make up a story to help somebody, that's what you'd say. Now Gary helped Lynn move. He was, he was in the helpful friend circle. The state puts up the friends. They put those two charts of friends. Well, well Gary goes in the, in the Jesse and Jenny, actual helpful friends who did things like help her move, help her move her mother's things run errands for her, visit her, visit her in the hospital. Those were that group of friends, her real friends, her real current friends. Sounds like Lynn varied friends from time to time. But remember when Gary was here and he talked about the phone call that he heard? He happened to be at Lynn's, at, at, um, at Jenny, Jenny Flower's home, and Lynn's calling. And, and you heard testimony from people how Lynn would call. Just talk, talk, like to do that. And the phone was on speaker, and he could hear her talking for an hour or longer. And what was one of the things that he told you he heard her say? She had three ways she wanted to commit suicide. Also at the scene, another issue is the rigor mortis. It's undisputed. When did Lynn die? When did she actually die? If, if, if the deputy medical examiner had taken a temperature of her, we might have um, a closer idea, but what we have that we can use is the rigor mortis and the state of it. And it's undisputed and unrebutted. Rigor mortis starts in the jaw, the face, and like and starts to move down to the arms. From there, it goes over the rest of the body, and it, it your trunk of your body becomes uh, rig, has, gets rigor, moves to the large muscles of your legs, and they get rigor. But it hadn't gone to those spots on Lynn. It was at the beginning stages. The deputy medical examiner agreed with with us that it completes within six to eight hours. And she arrived at the scene at 6.10. Deputy medical examiner arrived at 6.10. She said it took her 30 minutes to look at the scene, to photograph, because a lot of the pictures that we've seen over the last three weeks were taken by the deputy medical examiner herself. She took them. So it took her time to look at the scene, look at the body, and so on. But her arrival was at 6.10. The, police, the 911 call was made right around 5 o'clock, a few minutes before. It took her a while. So rigor is, is increasing in that time. It's more than an hour, hour and a half even, from the time Jesse arrived at the home until she looks at the body. So it had not moved down to Lynn's trunk. It had not moved to her lower extremities. And so we, and that's consistent too, isn't it, with what Henry said about, Henry Spiller, about the drugs in her system and about how long had they been there. He said a couple hours. Use the phrase a couple hours. So what we can see by that, by the state of that testimony of how long the drugs are in her system and how, long, how far the rigor has progressed, 
that she's only dead a few hours. She died in the afternoon, not in the morning. pointed out the Medical Legal Investigation of Death book by Spitz and Diaz and Deputy Medical Examiner didn't dispute that what was in there would be authoritative. Lynn was being seen by a lot of physicians. The state has tried to suggest throughout this trial that there was nothing wrong with her or basically nothing wrong with her. That she was not disabled, not in bad shape. That's what they have, that's how they've presented the case to you, but it's really not true. And anyway, does it really matter objectively what somebody, how somebody might perceive her? Does it more matter how Lynn saw herself? I think that's what really counts. If somebody is going to decide to exit, take their own life, then it's because of how they feel, right? It's not because of how you or you or you or me or anybody uh, sees her medical history. It's how she feels about her life and her, and her pain. And she was in pain. She saw herself as in a lot of pain. And we've got records from pain management that uh, you know, back in 2017, the pain interferes with sleep, with da daily activities, and makes her feel frustrated. And at that time, she did the Owestry uh, score, and it's 31 out of 50. <clears throat> and we introduced the Owestry, uh, Owestry Disability Score. And you know, look at the things that a person rates themselves on. It's how intense the pain is, how intense it is to you, how your social life is. Do you have a good social life or not? How is your, you know, sleeping, and how is your employment, and how is your friendships, and all of those things that you just fill it out, and you, you let them know how you're feeling about yourself. And apparently, she saw, when, when the, she filled out the answers, we don't know what they were, but however she filled them out, the, the, when, the, when it was graded, she came up with a 31. That's how Lynn saw her life as a 31, which is almost completely disabled, really, as how she saw herself. And the pain interferes with her activities of daily living. It says she, she's had pain for a long time. Look at that. Osteoarthritis in her lower lumbar spine since 1991. Numbness, weakings, weakness in her legs bilaterally, pain aggravated by her ADLs, activities of daily living. And on her urine screen from September 26, 17, it's appropriate for alprazolam, but inappropriate for lamazepam. It's not prescribed to her. We'll, uh, we'll repeat it another visit. Again, she's not taking the pills away she's supposed to. She's taking them not as prescribed. And again, they're stopping the opioids. We're going to stop the opioids. And you heard, didn't you, throughout this trial, the dangers of benzos and opioids. And we know that. We know that we did probably even need to have people tell us about it because we know it from what we hear are overdose deaths, the dangers of it. But here, you know, She's got inappropriate pills in her urine screens. She was breaking her hydrocodone in, 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 in half so she could make them last longer. Uh, some things are giving her some relief and, and some are not, not but her, she's got a lot of risks now, doesn't she? She's got risks of respiratory depression, mortality for taking opioids concurrently with the benzos. Her primary care physician and herself, this doctor, uh, think it's important to stop one of the drugs. And again, again, we've got the osteoarthritis. The problems continue. 
And they got so bad, didn't they, that she's got so many drugs in her, and along with alcohol, that Lynn's been discharged from the practice, the, her, from her primary care's practice, because of noncompliance. And again, inappropriate for alcohol. The state at the beginning of the case, remember, asked their witness, Dr. B, whether there was any evidence in the record that Lynn had any problems with her eyes. No evidence. But it wasn't true. And I know it was painstaking as I was going through those, if we can remember back to day one or two, as I was going through all those medical records with Dr. B, but there was a reason. Because it wasn't true, and I thought it was important that this jury, that you ladies and gentlemen see, that in fact, she'd been complaining about dry eyes and eye pain for a long time. Well, that, those statements weren't factual. Again, she was offered the referral to a pain psychologist. She declines it. Um, she declines nutrition services. She declines uh, physical therapy. And record after record, if you want to see it, you can ask maybe, uh, possibly we can send those back for you to look at. But again, after again, uh, she's encouraged to, to, to exercise, to quit smoking, and to not mix these pain pills. But it isn't just at, at advanced <clears throat> pain management. It's also at Aurora, another facility where she was seen, and, uh, and we can see that she struggled with anxiety. Uh, and they had a discussion, didn't they, with the effects, side effects of taking benzos and opioids and the risk of a morbidity. And so that was a discussion. And, you know, her doctor says, due to her pain, all she does is sit around and smoke, sometimes three packs per day. I think there's 20 cigarettes in a pack. That's 60 cigarettes in a day. Day after day, that's all she's doing. Has chest tightness because of it. She continues to complain of GI issues and can eat only very little. So she says, eating very little, yet she's gained 30 pounds since December. I don't know how, how that happens if you're not eating. Again, she comes in for medication management. They told her, I'm not going to increase the benzodiazepines that you're taking. Um, as the dose increases, your side effects increase, and your age increases the side effects. She's now in her 60s. I'm going to try her on Lexapro, a half a tablet. She's got heart palpitations. And she has numerous risk factors. Heart disease, obesity, hyperlipidemia, for which she's refused statins, tobacco use, we recommend stress test. Concerns, the doctor doesn't even list them because there's so many. Instead, she says she has complaints. Complaints are concerns which include numerous in capital letters with an exclamation point. The woman was com a complainer. And I'm not here to bash Lynn, but this is just the person we're dealing with here. She was complaining. And notes such as she has depression or agoraphobia, fear of going out, or uh, she appears older than her age. And psych, she's very argumentative. She seems to be depressed. She seems to be, uh, talks about having nothing since her parents died a few years ago. Told another note, I told her, it's unsafe to take alprazolam and narco. High risk of cardiac death if she continues to take the narco. I will not refill the alprazolam. I can't put my license at risk. That's how bad it had gotten. Can you imagine that in the record? Doctor's afraid of her own medical license. Lynn gets very mad at me and says, I am the one who referred her to pain management. She wants some medication. She really needs to go see someone new for a therapist, but she won't do that. <clears throat> She's depressed. And again, the suggestion that there's no problems with her eyes is uh, not true. December of 2017, she's at, at uh, seeing Dr. Rogers and there is uh, a problem with eyes that is discussed 
Uh, she uses artificial tears at least four times a day. So when the state starts their case and asks their witnesses if there are any indication that she's got eye problems, obviously the witness, Dr. B, didn't really take a close look at the records. It's just easy to say no because they want it to be a death by tetrahydrazoline. Right? That's the decision she made, and they're going to stick with it and not look at the entirety of the woman's medical history to see what's accurate or not. Here's another note. This is a new doctor, Abdullah. Now she's discharged from her prim uh, previous primary care physician clinic due to breaching the contract, pain management contract. She tested positive for other substances. She weaned herself off of Oxy, supposedly. Uh, she's, a, she's an only adopted child with no extended family. She lives in a condo she bought and has a couple friends who come visit. She also was at ProHealth and the main records we know from ProHealth is from her hospital stay from September 15th through September 28th, 2018. That's a long time. Hospital does not keep you there for, well, that looks like um, 13 days, unless, there's some, unless you're not healthy. We know that from our personal experience. Now, the state suggested, didn't they, that Jesse was lying when she said that she brought Lynn pills, <coughs> lied about a camera, lied about pills, but it was true because it was in the record, uh, which we'll come to in a minute. When she came to the hospital, she was not um, a person that really looked like she, she wanted to keep living because she signed a do not resuscitate. She didn't want chest compression, no shock, no intubation. She's made that decision. And that's when she first arrives on September 15th. That's how she felt. There's the medications sent to the pharmacy for storage. The patient's medications sent to the pharmacy for storage. It was true. When, when, when the information was asked by the state of their own witnesses of whether or not there's anything in the record to suggest that Jesse brought medication to Lynn and they said, no, 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 there it is. And who else told you but the neighbor? Remember when the neighbor came over and or testified in court, Jean Tanel, and she also said that Lynn asked her to bring her medications, but she wouldn't do it because of the cameras. So if you don't even want to believe Jesse, certainly have no reason to uh, discount what is said by the neighbor. Pro-health records, the diarrhea, the liquid stools, it's been going on for four years. This is not something recent, the suggestion that somehow Jesse's doing something recently that's causing this, four years. She did meet with palliative medicine, and they help patients and families dealing with serious, potentially life-limiting illnesses and to navigate their care. She seemed upset, refused to talk about doing what the GI was recommending, which was apparently a colonoscopy, but she's in the hospital for almost two weeks. There's something wrong with Lynn. She isn't in good health. She doesn't want to do what GI recommends, and frankly, um, if you remember, the testimony was that she would be released on the condition that she'd have a full-time caregiver. If not, the record said she was to go to a nursing home. Lynn didn't want to go to a nursing home. Lynn doesn't have full-time care. Another point. Remember, the witnesses were asked by the government, any indication that, that, that Lynn was needing a walker? No, none, none. Another 
another thing that's not true. Because again, she began walking with a walker. It's in her medical record. It started before she came to the hospital, and there's a picture at the scene of the walker on the couch. She's got lots of past problems. Her medical history is, is, is significant. Don't let anyone tell you it wasn't. It was to her. So the state asked her witnesses after witness, remember any indication that Lynn was disabled? They started out their presentation by suggesting that the money she was getting from the federal government was for old age social security. That's what the, they were testifying to until we got them to agree that the, 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 that the money she was getting was for social security disability, not for old age social security. And remember, there's no indication the witnesses said that she was getting any free things from the government. There's no indication she was on food share or uh, food stamps or Quest, nothing at all. But the certified records were admitted that show that Lynn was in fact getting, and we introduced these, that she was getting free food as early as 2015 or 20. 15. Sorry, I'm just drawing a blank on my date. I think it goes back earlier than that. For years. Even she was getting it for years. So we've got a woman that the federal government has determined is disabled to the point that they're going to give her Social Security disability, and the state's giving her food share, which, and it was 2015, I think, when she... Uh, she got it even before 2015. Now we did hear the state brought in about the other, the, the other friends. And I have no doubt that they care about Lynn in some way. But the person really who was there day after day, day after day, day after day after day after day to care for Lynn and to watch movies with her and to, and to go shopping, and yeah, to, you know, Lynn gave her money, no doubt. It was Jesse. They, they brought in Jim Kareem. Uh, I'll get to her in a second, but before her, what about Jim Kelleher? You know, they, the state brings in Jim Kelleher, who wants to deliver a birthday present to her in September. Her birthday was in June. That's a very close friend, isn't it? who's just thinking about giving a birthday present three months after your birthday. And we do know that, uh, as to Corrine, Poza, who came in, she had a bit of a poor memory. And I can understand that after the passage of five years, our memories aren't as good as they were back, back when something happened. It's hard to remember precisely. It's hard to remember even nine months later, six months later, sometimes even a week later. So I understand that five years have elapsed. But she denied, remember the discussion with her about the, um, about the safety deposit box. And in the safety deposit box was supposed to be $50,000 that Lynn had put in there. And we asked Ms. Poza, isn't it true that you told police back when you were interviewed originally about this, that Lynn had told you she'd taken them, that 50000 out of the safety deposit box? And she said no. But through the questioning of Detective Hoppy, he was able to tell you that actually back when Ms. Poza <coughs> was interviewed <coughs> four or five years ago, that she did in fact tell him that Lynn told her that the money, that Lynn had taken the money out of the safety deposit box. It wasn't in there anymore. She took her own 50000 out of it. And the state wanted you to think that 
Jesse did that. That she took fifty thousand cash out of it. It was taken out by Lynn. Who knows when? Also, on the stand, Miss Posa says, "Oh, we're such good friends. Lynn and I were such good friends till the end. Very good friends." But back in five years ago, when she was interviewed, and this was verified by Detective Hoppy, when she was interviewed five years ago and asked how good a friend she was with Lynn, that, that time, right after Lynn died, she said, we used to be very good friends. Not so much the last couple of years. Not so much the last couple of years. This group of friends wasn't such good friends the last couple of years. Anthony. Well, Kareen said she last saw Lynn in February 2018. That's a, that's, that's a lot of months for a very good friend. These are the, the, the cards that were brought into court, right? and submitted to the FBI lab ultimately as known handwriting of Lynn Hernan. And Anthony Poza ta talked about these documents and, and he compared these, and he also was talking about another document, wasn't he, in court where he said, I know that document could not have been written by Lynn because two reasons. The two reasons were my mom's name, Corrine, is misspelled. And two, she used my mom's maiden name. Now, as to the second point, let's say if you've been friends with somebody for 30 years, we can all relate to people we've known since high school, we know them by their maiden names. People we've known for a long time, since they were single, we know them by their maiden names. We have them saved by their maiden names. I think of my high school friends by their maiden names. So there's nothing at all suspicious. In fact, it suggests that Lynn probably did write it because what's the chance of Jesse, if that's the suggestion, Jesse knowing what Corrine Posa's maiden name was. But the other point he said was that she couldn't spell, she would never misspell my mom's first name. But then they brought in the cards and her name is spelled differently in almost every card. If you look, Corrine E, Kareem with an E, there's an I in that one. Um, I mean, there's one, two, three, four cards, and every one of them has Kareem spelled differently. Though Lynn couldn't spell first names, apparently. But to suggest, as Anthony did, that the document is, is not written by Lynn because Kareem is misspelled is... Um, contrary to in what are we know are known documents because suppose a family brought these in and and showed them of course uh, they also said uh, Kareen also said did she not that Lynn was always <coughs> writing things at home she always had her pad she was writing wills she was writing documents that was something Lynn was known for and she would said there would be documents everywhere, here and there, all around the place. So that's something that Lynn did. That was Lynn. Writing new wills, writing obituaries, writing cards, writing letters, writing notes. That was Lynn. That's something she did, and most likely did even when she was in the hospital sitting there for almost two weeks. When Jean was brought in to court and um, said that, d d denied that she had said Lynn was suicidal, but we established it through the detectives that she was. Remember when the medical examiner was here and we introduced her own data, the medical examiner's own data, to show, does it not, that people do commit suicide? This is for Waukesha County. This were the years that she provided um, information on. And we have plenty of people in the age range of the 41 to 65 and above. 2020, there's 37 people in that two higher age ranges that 
that committed suicide. And how do people com commit suicide? You can see all the ways in Waukesha County that it's happened, and it's sad. We're sad that people ever feel that to that point that they um, that, that, that that's what they want to do. But people do it. People do choose to exit. And we have any number of people that have ingestion, inhalation, ingestion type of uh, deaths, suicidal deaths, where you ingest some substance. And here, when we ask for the breakdown of what types of products uh, or, or pills that people are taking to kill themselves, we got this breakdown. And remember, Dr. B went through it and she marked how many were actually overdoses from benzoids and benzos and opioids. Very dangerous drugs. Lynn was thinking about her death. She wrote her own obituary. She'd been thinking about her death since uh, at least 2016, because that's when this particular document appears to have been written and notarized by um, one of the bankers at BMO, uh, BMO, who came in here and indicated that's her seal, that's her signature. She, she's the one who notarized this document. Misspelled Jesse's last name. She can't spell names. But Lynn wrote that. Jessie wrote that. She's not going to misspell her own name. Make no mistake about it. Dr. B is ca called this cause of death tetrahydrazoline poisoning. That and that alone. That's what she says the cause of death is. She's never had a tetrahydrazoline death. She has no experience with that at all. Zero. This is the inventory that was taken of all the pills at Lynn's home and what was prescribed and what remained. Zero, 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 one, zero. Lynn took a boatload of drugs. When the first test was requested from NMS Labs, and it came back, it didn't even check for baclofen. How is it possible that you really paid attention, doctor, to what was at the home? There's bottles of baclofen here, and you don't ask for baclofen tests to be done. It's a deadly drug. Doc, or Henry Spiller said to you, that's the bad boy. In this case, that was the bad boy. So well, she's got it. Yeah, she ran a lot of tests because, oops, <laughs> I forgot to check for baclofen. Need to run it again. What were the drugs in her? Baclofen, cyclobenzapine, hydrocodone, alprazolam, nifedipine. Not fatal <coughs> levels, the state says. These therapeutic levels? Therapeutic levels? No. Well known to like drugs and alcohol. That that never changed. Lynn grew up that way, and she stayed that way. Maybe the pills changed, or the alcohol changed, or the drug of choice, or but that's what she did. So it's it's just oh, it's, it's so frustrating sometimes. <laughs> just thinking of like how she was. It's I'll tell you this: she didn't overdose on any kind of prescription medication. Okay. Everything was a therapeutic level. Therapeutic level. You know, Dr. B testified that Visine, which is um, the product we know with tetrahydrosoline in it, um, testified about it. We know it's been on the market since 1959. We didn't hear about any reported deaths. She says it's outlawed in France. That's not true. It's not outlawed in France. It's not approved. No one sought approval. It's not outlawed. It's being careful with our words. 
not trying to mislead you ladies and gentlemen of the jury in this case. There is no evidence presented that any company was denied approval of, of tetrahydrazoline or visine <coughs> in France. It's misleading, as was Dr. Kosinko's abstract. Misleading. She put statistics on there, statistical trickery. Well, maybe that's a little harsh on her. Maybe that might hurt a little bit to hear that, but that's how Henry described it. He is so experienced in this area of toxicology. He's peer-reviewed toxicology articles for other people that, that want to uh, print them and have them published. He's the peer reviewer, one of them, not of his own, of course, and it wouldn't pass muster. And I understand that she's a younger scientist. I understand that she wants to find a novel subject to write about. I understand wanting to be recognized. But this is only an abstract. It's not even a written article, much less submitted for peer review, much less next step go to be published in any kind of literature. Henry, on the other hand, has uh, written and published uh, at the Nobel level. I mean, we're talking over 200. A 44-page curriculum vitae, CV. These were the positive findings that came through. And look at what she has in her system. It's just incredible to see the number of drugs and the quantities of the drugs, and maybe one alone, fine. But the combination, deadly. Dr. Thomas said it was a polydrug overdose. Where does, uh, where does tetrahydrazoline rate in the dangerousness of the drugs, according to Henry Spiller, world-renowned expert in toxicology, at the bottom of the list? At the bottom of the list. Remember also Dr. Kosinko bringing in an article that in her rebuttal, she came back up for like a last rebuttal, she brings in some article that is from somebody she met at a conference. It's been cited twice. In other words, no one's citing that article. It's cited twice. It's not well received in the toxicology community because it's not being cited. Now, Henry Spiller is able to, with his decades of experience at working at national poison control centers, where he's doing real-time work with people in hospitals who are in for overdoses. And, uh, and he is dealing with the doctors and the nurses and the the hospitalists and the emergency room people, and he's trying to calculate what's going on and what's in their system. Remember, a girl says, I've got 20, I took 20 Tylenol, and he looks, he says, no way, didn't take 20. I know based upon the levels I'm seeing, it's 30 or 40, whatever the number was. He knows that, he does that, it's what he does to save people's lives. And he follows the patients, doesn't he? From the minute he gets the call from a hospital, that somebody is on an overdose through their discharge or their death. He knows how to calculate how many pills. Nobody else knows how to do that that, brought, that was in this trial. And he calculated that Lynn has 33 to 42 tablets. And it's higher than it was originally because other drugs were found. Because remember, there were pills in her belly, right, that were never tested. But he did the calculation, 33 to 42 pills. That is a boatload of pills, consistent with this boatload of pills, bottles, mostly empty, not all, found at the scene. And nobody's shoving 33 to 42 pills down somebody's throat. No way. Remember, Lynn was a savvy pill taker. She'd been taking pills and all sorts of pills for a long time. 
No one's going to trick her on her pills. Lynn knows what she's doing. She's been taking them for years. And there's no indication in the record that anything was forced because I specifically asked if there's any sign of injury to a mouth, to a throat, any, a trachea, anything to suggest that there's any kind of forced ingestion, and there isn't. There is not. She took them herself because she wanted to. And as to those other cases that were cited by um, Dr. Kosinko, for example, Henry Spiller actually calculated the amount of tetrahydrazoline that was in that child at peak. 115 ng per milliliter. Now there's a scarcity of cases. You think that, there, that we should be able to come in here and, and show you case after case after case of tetrahydrazoline and what levels should be, but there aren't. If they were out there, we would have them here for you to see. But there is that case where he's able to do the calculation. 115 Lynn was 160. 115 had a little bit of problems, uh, a little bit of respiratory uh, uh, depression, used a little mask of oxygen on the child, rapid improvement. That's what 115 NG per ml does to a little child. <coughs> and he made a point to let you all know that children are not little adults. The effects on a child are of, of uh, any kind of drug are going to be much, uh, much higher, though stronger, than that on, any, that on, an, on an adult. Yeah, the five, um, the five pills. Five pills found in Lynn that the medical examiner never tested. And in fact, didn't know what they were, never bothered to figure out what they were until we <coughs> met with her and pointed out the number 30 on one of them. And couldn't that be a nephetapine? And between that date and when she came into court, she agreed. She looked it up to see if we were right which we were, she said you were, right. None of this was taken into consideration by her at all. Never tested them. What kind of medical examiner, when you're talking about a poisoning, so fixated on the THC? Why did she fixate on it? She'd never seen it before. I agree, probably, if she says that, it's probably true. It's Sherry Kosinko from NMS Labs who was all excited, wasn't she, about, at that time, about this high level of THC because she's wanting to do this article. She's got an abstract, she's getting her lab automatically tests for THC, and now she's got this case with a high level. She wants to be recognized, she wants to cite it, so she gives a suggestion to, to Dr. B that this is fatal. This is what killed her. Because what other evidence is there of it? There's not. It's not true. There's a lot of drugs in her system. Dr. Thomas told you that. Mr. Spiller told you that. You can see the charts for yourself. It is um, just an incredible number of pills. And Lynn wasn't healthy. Dr. Thomas was careful to tell, this, tell all of you about the other problems with Lynn, like her fatty liver disease, which shows the, the alcoholism, the stenosis that she, she would have thought um, if there wasn't anything with drugs, that there would have been a heart issue that might have killed her, her obesity. She's 251 pounds of death. How did she gain? You know, from earlier records, we see 50, 100 pounds. This is incredible weight gain. She's type two, di type 2 diabetic, the pulmonary disease, the interstitial myocarditis, the hypertension. The woman had a lot of, a lot of health problems.
And Jim Berg was in, uh, in court to talk about her finances too. He said that she was broke. She knew she was broke, tying into financial things. Um, this wasn't news to her. But before I leave on the medical part of it, remember Henry Spiller said that he did write an article about tetrahydrosoline and its effect in sexual assaults. And he said he wrote it and did the research on it because he wanted the FBI to, to adapt, adopt this as one of the standard tests that they use when, when rape kits are done. And, and of course, when the FBI makes recommendations, you don't have a, a city or a state is free to reject or accept them. But his goal was to get the FBI to recognize the THC, uh, to, to make the testing for THC a part of the recommended national protocol, I think is what he said, when they're testing blood or urine. And that's probably, isn't it, why NMS labs ultimately put the testing for tetrahydrosoline in their regular testing regimen because they get all blood for, or urine to test in all sorts of cases. People use the lab not just because somebody died, but for any reason, including you could send urine for a rape test. And so they accepted that recommendation, it seems, and put that as part of their regular testing. So when it comes to first degree intentional homicide, the state has not proven it. They have the burden to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. They didn't do that. They failed. Such a serious charge. Defendants aren't required to prove their innocence. The law presumes every person charged with a commission of an offense to be innocent. The burden of establishing every fact is beyond the state. Ladies and gentlemen, if you can reconcile the evidence upon any reasonable hypothesis consistent with the defendant's innocence, you must do so. You must do so. Return a verdict of not guilty. And as to the homicide, that's exactly what we have here, an absolutely reasonable hypothesis of the defendant's innocence. And you must return a verdict of not guilty if you agree with that. There are other words in jury instructions, such as you should. But here, this one is must. It's must. Of course, the last part of the instruction, and what no doubt the state will indicate to you when they get back up here, I don't get a second turn. They'll say, you know, it's your d duty to give the defendant the benefit of every reasonable doubt, but you're not to search for doubt, you're to search for the truth. But by their own admission, all we have here is circumstantial evidence. There is really, that's all it is. It's a circumstantial evidence case. I don't know, it's not easy to search when you're missing so much information, like testing of pills and saving of evidence at a scene. And I did, and I hope you can see my chart, because I think it's important to look at how, what, it, what does that even mean, reasonable doubt, or proof beyond a reasonable doubt? It's such a, ter it's such a legal term. It's hard to, hard to understand it. But you can look at this chart and kind of get an idea. If there's no trace of evidence, of course, well, that would be not guilty. But even if there's any evidence at all, a scintilla of evidence that would require a not guilty. If you have a reasonable suspicion, which should be based on specific or particular facts or reasons, it's not based on a hunch or a guess, so it's more than a hunch or a guess, we'll call that a reasonable suspicion, not guilty. What about if you've got probable cause? You hear that all the time 
in, even if you're watching TV. Uh, we got probable cause, we're going to get a warrant, or probable cause for this or that. Reasonable and trustworthy information that a particular person has committed a particular crime. What if we have that, if you think that there's that here? That's a not guilty. Well, let's go even higher on the chart and think about what if we've got the greater weight or amount of evidence? In other words, there's a greater weight of the state's evidence compared to the defense evidence. If you felt that, which I don't, based upon Dr. Thomas and Henry Spiller, but if you felt it, it still requires a not guilty because that's only a preponderance of the evidence that is inadequate to convict. Even if you have a firm belief that the allegations are true, in other words, clear and convincing evidence, you must vote not guilty. That requires not guilty. And if there's any reasonable doubt, it's not guilty. Only if the state presented evidence that went on that ladder, those stairs, all the way up here, would you be able to vote guilty? And I submit that as to the first degree, intentional homicide, the intentional taking of Lynn Hernan's life, that they have not proven their case. I do want to talk to you about the financial things. So the state suggests that Jesse was taking all this money from Lynn. Actually, Lynn and Jesse were close, and Jesse, Lynn gave Jesse money all the time because she wanted to. And Lynn spent a lot of money before Jesse was even even on the scene. We took the total account balances, and you can look at it if you want to dig through the, the financial records. We've added things up. And you can see that in 2014, she started with 346000 And by January 15 of 2015, she's down to 305000 And by January of 2016, we have her down to $272,000. And the first check that was written to Jesse, ladies and gentlemen, was in July of 2016. And this continues on for the rest of the the rest of the uh, the accounting. But remember, the, the first checks to Jesse are in July of 2016, and the FBI, who we brought in here, again, the state did not bring in the FBI. They didn't want you to hear from the FBI. The checks written to Jesse, she rated them as a common source. Support for common source. Now, I know that this chart is not the easiest chart to understand. I had to have it hammered in my head again and again. So, of course, if they're, they never say they're certain, apparently, the FBI doesn't do that. But we've got inconclusive in the middle. We're not sure. As we move to the right, it's like more likely that the person wrote it. And as it moved to the left, it's more likely the person didn't write it. That's really how this goes. So all the checks that were written to Jesse, the, the name, Jesse Krzyzewski, not always spelled correctly, and the numerals were, writ were support for common source for Lynn. That Lynn likely wrote the Jesse's name and the amounts. As to the signature, the Lynn Hernan signature, because of the lack of clarity in documents that she had at her disposal, she was inconclusive. That isn't a support for a different source. It's inconclusive. And I think there was a suggestion during this trial, as I recall, somebody suggesting, well, if Lynn had duplicate checks, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't Jesse be able to duplicate her signature from the duplicate check? Well, first of all, that's a if, if, if. There's nothing in this record that Lynn had duplicate checks. So that would be a guess. We're not here for guessing. If Lynn had duplicate checks, bring in somebody from the bank, from the deluxe check ordering company, 
the state should do that, right? And, and say that Lynn had duplicate checks. There's nothing in this record that she had. But second point, um, we know, don't we, from our duplicate checks that the signature is blocked out. They've done that for years on duplicate checks just for the purpose that if somebody steals your checkbook or you misplace it, you lose it, that people aren't going to see your signature. So that's just, re that's just ridiculous. Now we have known writing of Lynn. This was known writing of Lynn. Lynn liked to spend money. She liked to give money away. She liked to spend beyond her means. She liked to give away beyond her means. That's what she did. And giving money to Jessie made her happy. Jessie was like her daughter. Jessie was the person who was there all the time. And Jessie probably gave her a hard luck story. I need money for this and money for that. But Lynn was happy to give it to her. The crime requires that it be without her consent. There's no evidence here that Lynn didn't consent. Lynn, in fact, gave the money willingly to Jessie. But she liked to spend money, and she liked to give it away. As I told you, check no, item numbers 47 through 56 and 58 through 83. Those were uh, support for the writing being of Lynn's. She wrote the body of those checks. And the two in between that, I should point out, because you might be wondering, well, where's 50 or 67? Uh, oh, I think this, 57. Uh, they were confirmed as Lynn's signature. Now look at how her spending dramatically increased. So here we've got Lynn going to the hospital. She got $19,000. She has a discussion on September 21st with pallet, palliative care and spend, 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 spend. Once she knows that she has to either go in a nursing home, which she doesn't want to do, she's made a decision. And it's spent and spending. And that's when the ATM withdrawals began. And Lynn liked to have cash. Of course she sent Jesse to do things for her. Lynn's discharged from the hospital and she's down quite a bit of money and is all after her discussion with, with hospital people about the palliative care, having to go into a nursing home or having full-time care at her home. Withdrawal, withdrawal, withdrawal. When, okay, now think about the two loans you heard about in this trial. You heard that Lynn applied for a loan first with her uh, primary bank, which is BMO, BMO Harris. And there, if you looked at the documents carefully, she did exaggerate her income was exaggerated about 50%. She did note on those applications exactly what she had in the bank, and the application was done face to face. In other words, she was there at the bank doing the application, and she put down how much money she had in her bank account, and it was under $20,000. The suggestion has been made that Lynn was being taken advantage of and had no idea of her finances, false. She knew, she put it on her loan application. Now that was denied. So by increasing her income by 50%, she doesn't get the loan. So they together decide to make the application for Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs, they put up a, a, its income of $100,000. It's obviously poor underwriting, never looked into anything but they accepted the documents and they gave the loan, they approved it. And on the day of the disbursement, the key thing is, Jessie added Lynn to her Wells Fargo account. She was added. And as to switching the names uh, and adding her to the account, that was done in person too. We brought in the, the, uh, the man that, um, did that form with 
Lynn and Jesse at the bank, and he told you. You'd be there in person, in front of him, with identification, to prove who they are. Not only that, but he's so careful to make sure that people are not being taken advantage of, that, that both the customer and the, you know, both, both people, both customers before him, are not being taken advantage of, that are in a good mental state, that they know what they're doing, and that all, in fact, we heard that all the banks do that. That's part of protocol. They just make sure that they don't see anything, that somebody isn't nudging somebody or signing for them or whispering and telling them what to do. So they did go for a loan and there were obviously falsities told about the Lynn's income of 100000 <clears throat> but she wanted the money because by the time that February of 2018 rolled around, she didn't have much money in the bank. <clears throat> she just applied for the loan at, at, at uh, BMO and she had listed her assets at under $20,000. So Lynn was well aware in February 2018 that she only had $20,000. As to the theft from Lynn during her life, the state has failed to prove it. The record before us shows that Lynn gave Jesse the money willingly. She had no one else to give her money to. You can under, you, you might question it if somebody has heirs that are alive, like children, grandchildren, that you might want to leave your money to, but Lynn did not. She wanted Jesse to have it. She knows she's going out. She's giving it to Jesse. It is a lot of money. It's a tremendous amount of money. But just because it's a lot of money doesn't mean that Lynn didn't approve of it. And in fact, it's the evidence suggests she did. Jesse was the person that was there. No one else really knew Jesse. I knew Lynn like Jesse. She knew her. They're the ones that spent time every day, twice a day, together. And Lynn made a decision. She made a decision that she was going to exit. And she, she did that on October 3rd, once Jesse had left the home. We know it was then because of how long the body was deceased. The body was not dead in the morning the rigor would have spread. That's just false. She put on her father's dog tags. That's a sentimental thing to do. That's when you're thinking about going to another place to be with your loved ones, go to join my father, join your father, join her father, the person that she loved so much. She put on his dog tapes. And I don't mean that in a mean way. I mean it truthfully. She did a lot for me. So the fact of her being dead would do what for me? Well, the debt's kind of coming up to, to, to overtake the assets. She has Absolutely. more credit debt than she has money. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. So the money's running out. Yeah. So... But I don't get what you mean by that. I mean, yeah, they were. I don't understand what you're saying. The fact is, is she paid you two hundred thousand dollars over the last two years. Mm -hmm. You're the prime. You're, you are handling the money. You are on mm -hmm. the signer on the accounts. Yeah. You are running the show. Yeah. You are handling the credit card stuff. Mm -hmm. You know what's going on financially with her. Mm -hmm. The the money is going to be gone here shortly. So I would kill her because of that? People do weird things. Why would I kill her for money? I mean, it's just... It's my family. I, I, I tend to think that you didn't... When you say kill her... I, I, don't, it's just, I, mean, I, I, I don't think you killed her. I think she was sick. And she didn't want to... She was done. Yeah. And she wanted to, to finish her, her life. And she needed help. 
And even if you think, as the detective did, that that's what Jesse did, that is not, that is not a first degree intentional homicide, which is what is charged here. Look at the elements of the crime, that is not it. Even the detective thought it. As to count two, the state has not proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Lynn did not consent to giving Jesse that money. And in fact, she did consent. And remember, if you can reconcile the evidence on count two, the theft while Lynn was alive, with any reasonable hypothesis consistent with Jesse's innocence, you must do so. You must do so and return a verdict of not guilty. As to count three, which is the theft from the estate, uh, really the only comment I would make to you, ladies and gentlemen, as you heard during the case, the estate's not even closed. The estate is still open. When you, reach, when you go to the jury room and you deliberate and you look at all this evidence and if you want to see something, send a note. We'll send it if we can. I ask you to return verdicts of not guilty. The state has not proven their case. The, ver the only true and correct verdicts are not guilty. And thank you. Thank you. While you take those down, we'll just stand for a little bit. The state does have an opportunity to offer brief rebuttal, so we'll hear from that and then the final instructions. Just a note to all the people in the gallery, no one should have food, gum, or drinks. So if you have any of those, please uh, step out and get rid of them. Thank you. Thank you. Have a seat. Attorney Nikolai, when you're ready. Thank you, Judge. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, because we have the burden of proof, I get to address you one more time. And the video you were left with was Jesse Kraszewski asking the detectives, why in the world would I have any reason to kill Lynn Hernan if all of her money is gone? I submit to you there was 87,000 reasons to do that, because that's the amount of theft that Ms. Kraszewski has taken from the estate in this case. This is supposed to be a search for the truth. And what has happened is that it has become a full-blown attack on Lynn Hernan. I want you to think about some of the things that you've heard said about this woman. And then ask yourself, why does that matter? She's an alcoholic. She's an angry drunk. There's bottles of alcohol at the house. The intent is to mislead you. Lynn Hernan had no ethanol on board at the time of her death. Lynn Hernan was not a bad person. She was a complainer. She smoked 60 cigarettes a day. She needs to exercise. She was 251 pounds at death and bad at spelling. Why do those things matter to you? Why were those things presented to you over and over and over again in this case? I submit to you the intent was to mislead you. The intent was to shift your focus from the truth, which is what you are to be searching for. If Lynn Hernan taking her own life was such a reasonable hypothesis, consistent with the defendant's innocence, then why did she have to lie about it?
I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that the reason that everyone at the scene thought this was a suicide is because that was exactly Ms. Krzyzewski's intent that day. And it worked for a period of time until the toxicology came back. Is it really so surprising that detectives on that scene weren't taking empty water bottles with them? Do you think maybe what was collected would have changed had a witness come up to them and said, she's been drinking Visine for months. She's trying to kill herself. The intent was to mislead. Certain pills that she couldn't swallow, she had to crush them. That is nowhere in the medical records. Ms. Krzyzewski told Detective Hoppy that she brought meds into the hospital and told staff, I gave all these meds to Lynn, she's suicidal, and that staff took those away and put a camera in there because of that. That's a lie. That is nowhere in the medical records. You were asked if Dr. Bedritsky thought this scene was staged. Why didn't she do something right away the next day at autopsy? Oh my gosh, the scene was staged. I have to do something. She did. She collected all that powder. The first time she'd ever done that, she collected it and sent it to be tested. You were asked why, why, would, why would Ms. Krzyzewski leave these expensive bracelets behind? You know who got those, though, because we showed you. Very quickly after, Ms. Krzyzewski goes and pawns those items, lying to the pawn store, saying she's owned them for months and months, and takes the cash that they're worth. Oh, she got those bracelets. Was there $50,000 in a, in a safety deposit box or at Lynn's house? The thing we know about that is that that money was supposed to go to Anthony, and he sure didn't get it. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, when you consider the mapping evidence in this case, and you see Ms. Kershewski go back to Lynn Hernan's house that night on October 3rd, after everyone's gone, and the next day on October 4th, accessing that lockbox, consider that timeline. I have no doubt Ms. Krzyzewski knew that cash was gone when she talked about the lockbox with Detective Hoppy, but that's not why she brought it up. She brought it up because she alleged there's all kind of, of exculpatory stuff in there that <coughs> Lynn saved. I'm suicidal and recordings that I'm suicidal, it's all in there. She knew there wasn't anything in that lockbox, and that's why it's significant for you to consider. You've been now told that Gary Verdon is this really honest, upstanding guy who listened to a woman go on and on for an hour and a half about killing herself and didn't do a thing. A man who told you with a straight face that he remembered a bottle of eye drops in Lynn Hernan's garbage can because he had never seen them at anyone else's house in their garbage. That makes absolutely no sense, and you need to weigh his credibility when you consider whether anything he said <coughs> is correct. The same that you have to consider evidence as it was admitted into the record and not what Attorney Kugler wants it to be. Gene Tannell did not tell you Lynn Hernan was suicidal. No detective told you that. Attorney Kukler's comments are not evidence. Henry Spiller did not convince Dr. Kosenko to start testing for tetrahydrosoline at the lab. The spending that you were just shown in the blue charts absolutely matches what we proved to you in this case, that it changes drastically in 2016. Attorney Kugler says, we didn't want you to hear from the FBI. 
What the FBI was able to tell you in this case was that someone could have written something, but also maybe not. That's the extent. Attorney Kugler told you, well, the FBI never makes conclusions. Well, they do. They do. It was on the right side of the spectrum, and it's called source identification. I want you to think back to evidence that you've seen in this case of the one person who is very acutely aware of creating fraudulent documents that are very convincing. And I want you to recall that Ms. Kershewski told a roommate that she messed with that handwriting process anyway. So you're right, the state didn't think that that was important for you to hear in this case. Dr. Bedritsky is not going to make an important determination like the cause of death in 14 hours. Dr. Thomas did. Dr. Thomas, someone the defendant hired and paid to be here and tell you that. But she didn't tell you it was a suicide either. Dr. Thomas certainly didn't have the benefit of all the interviews that you've seen. Dr. Kosinko testified and showed you that abstract because three weeks ago, you were told by that team that you can't die from tetrahydrazoline. And that is not true. That is the value that Dr. Kosinko has to this case. She has her own data and her own lab to know that that claim is irresponsible and not true. Who didn't take a look at medical records in this case before offering a pretty serious accusation? Mr. Spiller, the graduate of a now defunct university with no doctorate degree, who told you that it's real important when you're making calculations to know about genetic or disease issues that would affect metabolism, had no idea that there was any issues with Ms. Hernan's liver. Dr. Thomas said, oh yeah, she did, and that would be real important to know. Nonetheless, he got up there and told you handfuls of pills that Lynn Hernan had. Why? Why was that information presented to you? Because I trust that you all have comprehended by this point that the things in someone's system affecting them at any given time are the levels in the blood. And that undigested, unmetabolized things in someone's stomach has no bearing. That's why Mr. Spiller said that medical examiners around the nation are not calling him and asking him to do these calculations for them. They know what affected someone because they have the tox in the blood. So I again ask you to consider, why were you presented that information? I hope it doesn't mislead you. I hope it doesn't shift your focus. Because ladies and gentlemen, dry eyes didn't kill Lynn Hernan. Back pain didn't kill Lynn Hernan. And I will mention this very briefly because the palliative care discussion during this case has taken up more of your time than the actual consult did in the hospital, which was 30 minutes. Look at that record. It does not say what Attorney Kukler wants you to think it says. Attorney Kukler got up here and- I'm gonna object to the constant reference to Attorney Kukler. Overruled, these are closing arguments. Attorney Kugler got up here and showed you a picture from Lynn Hernan's body of dog tags and told you that those mean something and that's why she put those on so she'd have them on when she got found. But no pants? 
or underwear? Think about that for a second. You're making this decision. You know that someone's going to find you and you're not gonna put pants and underwear on? That makes zero sense. Detective Hoppy told Ms. Kraszewski during the interview that I think you found the perfect victim. She had no family, you isolated her, and she had money. This group of friends who supported Lynn and loved her that didn't see her when Ms. Kraszewski entered the picture as often, why was that? Why didn't Lynn see the Anthony's and the Kareen's? Absolutely, she wasn't feeling good and no one could figure it out. But ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, to believe that this was a suicide, you would have to believe that by the most cosmic intervention in the entire world, it happened at the exact point in time when Ms. Kershewski maximized the amount of money that she made on this whole ordeal. I want you to think critically, and I believe once you have, you'll return guilty verdicts in this case. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I need to see the attorneys just for a moment. You all can stand.
Thank you. Be seated. Now, members of the jury, the duties of counsel and the court have been performed. The case has been argued by counsel. The court has instructed you regarding the rules of law which should govern you in your deliberations. The time has now come when the great burden of reaching a just, fair, and conscientious decision of this case is to be thrown wholly upon you, the jurors, selected for this important duty. You will not be swayed by sympathy, prejudice, or passion. You will be very careful and deliberate in weighing the evidence. I charge you to keep your duty steadfastly in mind and as upright citizens to render a just and true verdict. You are to decide only whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty of the offenses charged. Any consequences of your verdict are matters for the court alone to decide and must not affect your deliberations. The following six forms of verdict will be submitted to you concerning the charges against the defendant, Jesse R. Kashevsky. Count one, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Jesse R. Kajewski, not guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count one of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Jesse R. Kershevsky, guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count one of the information. Count two, we the jury find the defendant, Jesse R. Kershevsky, not guilty of intentional transfer of movable property having a value that exceeds $100,000 as charged in count two of the information. Hold on. mistake. So, because our verdict forms read a little different. So, I'm going to redo that as to count two. One reading, the jury find the defendant, Jesse R. Kershevsky, not guilty of theft of movable property, having a value that exceeds $100,000 as charged in count two of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Jesse R. Kershevsky, guilty of theft of movable property, having a value that exceeds $100,000 as charged in count two of the information. If you find the defendant guilty, answer the following question, yes or no. Was the property stolen more than $100,000? Count three, one reading, we the jury find the defendant Jesse R. Kershevsky, not guilty of theft of movable property, having a value greater than $10,000, but does not exceed $100,000, as charged in count three of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Jesse R. Kershevsky, guilty of theft of movable property, having a value greater than $10,000, but does not exceed $100,000, as charged in count three of the information. If you find the defendant guilty, answer the following question, yes or no. Was the property stolen more than $10,000? It is for you to determine whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty of each of the offenses charged. You must make a finding as to each count of the information. Each count charges a separate crime and you must consider each one separately. Your verdict for the crime charged in one count must not affect your verdict on any other count. This is a criminal, not a civil case. Therefore, before the jury may return a verdict which may legally be received, 
the verdict must be reached unanimously. In a criminal case, all 12 jurors must agree in order to arrive at a verdict. When you retire to the jury room, select one of your members to preside over your deliberations. The presiding juror's vote is entitled to no greater weight than the vote of any other juror. If you need to communicate with the court while you are deliberating, send a note through the bailiff signed by the presiding juror. To have a complete record of this trial, it is important that you communicate with the court only by a written note. If you have <laughs> questions, the court will talk with the attorneys before answering, so it may take some time. You should continue your deliberations while you wait for an answer. The court will answer any questions in writing or orally here in open court. When you have agreed upon your verdict, have it signed and dated by the person you have selected to preside. After you have reached a verdict, the presiding juror will notify the bailiff that a verdict has been reached, of course as to each count. Everyone will return to the courtroom. The verdicts will be read into the record in open court. The court may ask each of you if you agree with the verdicts. Madam Clerk, at this time, please swear in the officer. Do you swear that you will keep all jurors on this trial together in some private and convenient place and that you will not allow any person to speak to them or you speak to them yourself except to ask whether they have agreed on their verdict and that you will not, before they render their verdict, communicate to any person the state of their deliberations or the verdict they have agreed upon, so help you God? I will. Mm -hmm. All right, for the record, both of our jury bailiffs were sworn. All right, as you can see, I pulled out the tumbler. It has the information for each juror. I will give it a good spin. All right. First juror will be an alternate and not uh, initially or until perhaps not ever uh, deliberate as juror number 28. All right, the second juror, number 13. And the third, number 19. Now, we will have you in a separate jury room where you will wait. Um, you will not be able to discuss the case amongst yourselves, those who are the alternates. I'm not going to take away your electronics or anything like that. The same admonition that I've given you throughout this case remains. You may not discuss this case with anyone. You can't do any research. Don't review any news re newspaper reports or news reports. Um, and if something were to happen to one of the other jurors uh, during deliberations, then I would obviously have a conference with the attorneys and we'd discuss uh, how to proceed next. I know that can be a little bit of a letdown and we so appreciate all your time and attention here. Um, you'll all be excused. I know that lunch was ordered and uh, Jen and uh, Ken will figure out all of that, uh, but uh, I'll rise for the jury, please. My new pages in here, right? Click with this. Very good, John. Do you need a binder clip or something? No, that's fine. For the recommend, record, Madam Report, it's 1221. And for your record, Madam Clerk. Um, just be seated for one moment. I do want to put that sidebar on the record. Um, I informed the attorneys at sidebar 
Um, there was just a little bit of a snafu. Normally, I have the CCAP application do the randomized listing. Unfortunately, when that was done, we a little bit, I guess, lost in translation about number 28. And believe it or not, it will not let you redo it. <laughs> and so we brought the tumbler out. And then by agreement of the parties, we agreed that 28 would be the first number that I read. And that is what I did. Um, anything either side wants to add to that sidebar from the state? No, thank you. From the defense? No, thank you. All right, as you know, it's uh, we remain open while the jury is deliberating. For the attorneys, if you choose to leave, just please, I think you've already given Madam Clerk uh, the best contact number. My intent would be to let the jury uh, deliberate as long today as they are comfortable doing, and if that does not result in a verdict, uh, send them home, bring them back. Um, obviously, we'll cross that bridge if and when, but if they do receive or when they reach verdicts, then I will uh, give probably about a half an hour to 45 minutes to make sure everyone can assemble back here. If there's a need for me to go a little bit longer than that, for whatever reason, if there's a family member that's a little bit farther away, just let me know and we'll work on that, okay? Otherwise, we are in recess. Thank you, everyone.
seated, the audio is on, you can look at my point, the question and the answer. I know we're waiting for Attorney Cooper to at least start that. All right, I'll just go on the record. There's one question. Um, I know we don't have Attorney Kukler, but all other appearances are the same. Juror number 24 is our four-person. What is the purpose of the financial question for count two and count three that follows the if, quote, guilty, quote, verdict listing? And my proposed answer is as follows. Answer the question only if you find the defendant guilty. Any purpose of doing so are matters for the court alone to decide. And I've shown that to the attorneys, and Attorney Kukler's walking in. But for the record, Attorney Nikolai, do you agree with the court's response? Yes. Attorney Galaviz? Yes. All right. We scan everything in. You'll have it shortly. momentarily.
are back on the record. Uh, the jury at 2.58 p.m. Uh, did have another question. May we please have uh, exhibit number 98, 118, 117, 134, 7 through 20, 130, 131, 23 through 32. And I went through Madam Clerk's lovely exhibit list, highlighted it, uh, showed that to the parties, and then Madam Clerk pulled all the exhibits, and the parties have had an opportunity to review them. Any objections sending all of this back to the jury from the state? No. From the defense? No. All right, I will simply write C attached. Actually, I'm going to write all exhibits are attached, all requested exhibits. Okay, we're in recess. We'll let you know when we have the next communication from the jury. Thank you. You're welcome.
Well, right, but if it's a phrase. Mm -hmm. <laughs> love your phone. Do you know what a head note it was in? Head note 12, Dan. Mm -hmm. And 13, practice. Mm -hmm. certain it must be more than reasonably probable or likely. It must approach being inevitable. For example, practically certain that shouting a fire in a crowded theater will cause panic. It is not practically certain or very likely that the union of games will hurt next World Series next year. Yeah, let me see what it says. It's a uh, under 13 yep, okay. page 881. Okay, got it. All right, great. All right, good evening, everyone. We are back on the record. You're good. Appearances are as they were before at 534. The jury uh, had a question. And uh, obviously, we needed to assemble everyone. I did have the, a copy of the question printed off and placed on each council's table so that um, you would have a little bit of a head start, if you will, to look at uh, the question and provide input to the court. Uh, but the question is as follows. May we please have a definition and elaboration on the term, quote, practically certain, quote, listed in the second element under count one. And of course, count one being the homicide charge. The two elements that have to be proven are, one, the defendant caused the death of Lynn Hernan. There's a definition of cause that's provided right in the jury instruction. And then the second element is the defendant acted with the intent to kill Lynn Hernan. There's a definition of intent to kill, but it's that definition that includes the phrase or was aware that her conduct was practically certain to cause the death of another human being. And so that is the question. I uh, did a very brief search with my law clerk. We're finding just very briefly a federal case interpreting some Wisconsin law, but it's a civil case. I don't know if either of the parties have had an opportunity to find anything that's helpful in this situation or if there's any particular requests on how the court addresses this with the jury. Anything from the state? Judge, the only thing we've been able to find in relatively short order is jury instruction 923B and specifically in the comments, I believe under comment one, there's at least an elaboration part um, where it gives an example of what practically certain is under, as far as I can tell, what is sort of a generic arson situation. Um, but that's what we've come up with in the last five minutes or so. As far as the juror's request for elaboration, I don't think it's got a solid definition provided in that comment section, but at least has an example of what the legal term practically certain means. Can I have that number once again? Sure, it's 923B under the criminal jury instructions. How about from the defense? Yes, we also took a look at, at uh, 923B. Um, I think in this particular case that the answer that should go back to the jury is you should rely on the instructions as they've been given to you. I'm not asking that that long form be given. It wasn't given. Um, and I don't want to um, change the definition and the instruction mid midstream. Um, court gave the shorter instruction. That's the longer instruction that they're talking about there. I, I think that the jury should just rely upon what they've been given. All right, so I don't have 923 at my fingertips. It's not coming up in my normal search that I'm able to do on Word. I only have one of my volumes, so I will 
need to go grab uh, my other volume from upstairs so I can review that. Let me just tell you where it is. Can you get me sure you're going to take this? You can email, you can email it to you. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. I'll have you do it then. Okay. But we could do it as well. We've got it right here. Okay. 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 Great. To the judge. Right I know, but it okay. should be. The other, the case that I, my clerk Ryan was able to find is a federal case addressing Wisconsin law. Looks like it was a, a decision by Judge Randa. Boomsma v. Star Transport Inc. 2000, sorry, 202 F SUP 2nd 869. Let me give that to you again. 202 F SUP 2nd 869. We've sent that to you directly with the defense copy on the email. All right, thank you. I'll let you know when it comes in. It's an email from Attorney Crawford, so I have it. Can you uh, send me 923A? I don't know if it's helpful or not, but it's referenced in the notes. Yes, 
Yes, we are looking for that right now. Well, that one I was able to pull up. Okay. I think that's pretty much the remainder of the standard or at least the instruction that was used in this case as well so So when looking at the elements that the state has to prove, of course, the first one, as I referenced earlier, is the defendant caused the death of Lynn Hernan. There is a definition of cause that's provided. And then the second element is that the defendant acted with the intent to kill Lynn Hernan, and then intent to kill is further defined. Um, I agree and would acknowledge that um, the phrase practically certain is not something that's defined further in the jury instructions or really in any case that I could find other than that federal case, which I really haven't had a, I don't know if anyone else has read it. Um, it is a civil case, so it's, my gut says it's distinguishable. There's a different burden of proof um, there's an example given in the jury instructions for, um, I guess, why that language is included. Um, it's to really broaden the definition of intent, meaning there's more than one way. The example given, as you read, was the arson case where um, the arsonist has the intent to burn a building down perhaps hopes that everyone escapes, but if someone doesn't and dies, um, that is where that language would be included and 
um, a jury could find intent to kill because in that scenario, even though the intent was to burn a building down, burning a building down with people in it, that conduct would be practically certain um, to cause the death of another human being. Now, how I respond to this to the jury, I think, is to simply say the um, the jury, and I'm kind of on free flow thought here, but something to the effect of, you know, the jury must rely upon the definition of the elements of the crime that has already been provided to them. No further definition uh, or explanation of practically certain will be provided to them. Any objection from the state to that? No, Your Honor. How about from the defense? No, that sounds good. All right, I'll work with Madam Reporter to read back <laughs> off the record what I just said so I get that down verbatim. I'll certainly write it out, show the parties. Um, I believe um, we may have another question coming out shortly as well. So don't, oh, it is right next to me. So don't go anywhere. So this one is, has a time of 608. So this one is in respect to count two, if we, the jury find that money was stolen, but the amount was under $100,000, do we still deliver a guilty verdict, but then answer no to the follow-up question? Um, this is one that I've actually thought about ahead of time, and I think we may need to if they answer no, then the jury should be asked, was the value greater than $10,000 but less than $100,000 since it's really, we all know that the, the purpose behind asking that is the classification of felony for sentencing purposes if there is a conviction. Um, and I think I will have Madam Clerk work on another verdict form with instructions that answers this question with the consent of the parties. But why do we have to? Because the question is either it's under 100 or it's over 100, right, Judge? Well, no. The special verdict question says answer only if you find the defendant guilty. So I, I would refer back to only answer the special verdict question if you find the defendant guilty of count two. What's the special question again? Could you read it? It has out? to do with the value. Yeah, it I is. I know that. Wow. I'd like to just know how it was phrased. Sure. It is in the jury instructions that you have as well in the verdicts that were emailed, but it will say as follows. That's okay. I guess we could put the three options in there. Was the value more than 100? Was the value more than 10,000? Was the value more than 2,500? So the specific question in count two is, if you find the defendant guilty, answer the following question, yes or no. Was the property stolen more than $100,000? Um, That's what she's been charged with, right? Over 100. Correct. I don't think a no answer to that precludes them from ask, answering a follow-up question, which was the property stolen more than $10,000. Obviously, that would is something that would concern the court at the time of sentencing, and I'm going to need to know that, and I think the Defendant has a right to have that special verdict answered by the jury unanimously um, and not for the court to decide later on. Thank you. When I'm looking, though, at the pattern instruction for 1441, there's, you know, I, on the special question, they offer four options to the jury and the pattern instruction. 
Was the value more than 100000 Yes or no. Was the value more than 10000 Yes or no. Was the value more than 5000 Yes or no. Was the value stolen more than 2500 I mean, I think if you're going to make other options, then they should be offered all four. Because... I thought the, about that, too. The class changes. Correct. Right. What's the state's position? I think that's probably best to just include all the classification levels in the question, and that probably avoids other questions going forward. All right, let me work on that. That'll take a little bit of time with Madam Clerk. Um, I do want to answer the question, though. That first reminds them I just wonder if the original question should have been theft of movable property as charged in count two and then the special verdict, but be that as it may, that's not how it went. So I understand why the jury is asking that since they're Give me that, that, I think you gave me that number. That was 1441. I want to look at something for a second. So here's what I'm thinking. The elements of theft themselves do not include value. But value is a special verdict question. So I want... Standard instruction. I'm sorry? It's part of the standard instruction, 1441. What is part of? The determining value. No, I agree with you, but the elem, it's a special verdict question on value. The, it doesn't alter the elements of theft. The value when a, the amount alleged affects the penalty. Well, so yes. it may not have been completely correct to include value in the verdict question to begin with is what I'm saying in the, the the, when we when the verdict read, although I would note everyone agreed, but that the verdict should probably have simply read, we the jury find the defendant, Jesse R. Krzyzewski, not guilty of theft as to, charged in count two. So there's the not guilty and the guilty, and then if you find the defendant guilty, answer the following questions. 
question, yes or no, was the property stolen more than $100,000? Now, that's not what we did, but it is pretty significant because if we are at the lower value it's a misdemeanor so i mean it's a significant difference oh i agree with you and i okay. feel very strongly the jury needs to tell us what value they put on it and i think if we're going to do this for count two we might as well do it for count three even if they didn't add it ask and what I'm thinking of is taking out the value in the guilty and not guilty parts and have the four questions as to both with agreement of the party so kind of show them that they have to be two separate values one for each count right correct okay just include all four questions and say we're repla you know please see the revised verdict forms with agreement of both parties Yeah, I only have one at the moment. You're proposing to change the verdict to actually change language in the ver the upper part of the verdict. And I would have a problem with that. This is what the state's requesting, Your Honor. This attic, this is actually what the elements are of the crime charged and then the special question afterwards. She's being if they agree and fill out that verdict form, they'd be finding her guilty of theft, just plain and simple, and then they would answer the valuation question. I think that's appropriate. It still says as charged in count two. And so you that's yes. the reference. I, I don't have a strong uh, preference either way. You could leave it in with the 100,000. You could leave in the 10 to 100 and leave the questions. We might be back here with some more questions, but I, I think when you really break down what the elements of theft are, value is important uh, because as you said, it could be, um, could be more, could be less, and if it's substantially less, it could even be a different classification of charge altogether. So, I mean, I agree with adding those special questions at the bottom. I don't agree with changing the, the, um, the body of the original verdict. Well, I think we had that in there originally, and we might have to live with that and see what the jury does, but I think this will help clarify that for them, and we'll see. So I need to work on how I want to draft the responses to them. Um, I'll do that. I'll make sure the parties see that first before we send them back. Let me go off the record and Madam Reporter, I need that language for the first one.
on the record then. I worked with the parties at sidebar. It's not technically a sidebar. I had Madam Reporter working on getting me what I said about the first question that we were addressing. Um, and that was, may we please have a definition and elaboration on the term, quote, practically certain, listed in the second element under count one. My response, based upon our discussion earlier and confirmed by uh, Michelle, the court reporter, I tweaked it just ever so slightly, but I thought this read a little better, is as follows. The jury must rely upon the definitions provided in the jury instructions. No further definition or explanation of, quote, practically certain will be provided. And that's my initials. 6.37 p.m., and then uh, the verdict forms, Madam, where are those? All right. Oh. Um, and I just wrote out in response, you can, hold on, I'll take a break, everything together. The following verdict forms are being submitted to you on counts two and three. Please use these sets rather than the ones originally provided. And again, there's a not guilty on top of a guilty for count two, a not guilty on top of a guilty for count three, and then for both charges, we put the various uh, valuation special verdict questions so that they are not just given one or two, but all four under the statute. And that's with the approval, both things from the state? Yes. And from the defense? Yes. Okay, then we'll make sure these go back. And then Madam Clerk and I, if you would go take those back, please. There are more exhibits that are being requested. We haven't had an opportunity yet to pull them. Uh, but first exhibit listed is 501. That's a lab report. 619. Which is? a demonstrative exhibit used by uh, Ms. Eisenhart, and that's the handwriting uh, analyst. Somewhat funny, as we were joking, not really at sidebar, how I can't look at my handwriting anymore and not think of her testimony, so it seems to be fitting. Um, in addition, 522, which is part of uh, item 20, from the handwriting. I don't know what 64 is, but then 503 to 508 and 519 to 5, sorry, 515 to 519, those are all portions of the handwriting. Um, I don't know if it was everything requested. Anyone have I have to look at my notes. Was 64 something that was marked maybe for identification? No, we never marked it or referred to it in the trial. So I'm not sure. All right. Any objection to any of the exhibits requested? Other than, of course, I'll let them know 64 was not an exhibit used in the trial. No, from the state? Objection. no objection from the state. No, no objection. Could I have a copy of that note? Yep, we'll get that momentarily. I'll actually write my response and then actually just copy it. I just would it. like so to take easier. a look to make sure that I agree it says 64 on there. I just. I'm going to give it to you. Okay. I have no okay. I'll just tell you what they are down there. Her. 501 is her, I believe. It starts with 503, though, right? I marked that by accident, I think. No, it starts with 501. Okay. This is a lot of the handwriting stuff. So 501 is her report. 501. And then starting with 503 to 508. Skipping 511 and then 515 to 519. Actually, including 522. Wait one second. No, not there. 
sorry. That's all right. Are you on 15? 11. No, no 511. They did not ask for 511. There is no 12. Yeah, I didn't get to pull out all the extras in here yet. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 22. 17, 18, 19. Okay, I have to 19. 22. 21. 22. And then 19, which is the her demonstrative. It was that real shiny PowerPoint with a lot of blue, if I recall. My response, I'll just read it because it's very simple. 64 is not an exhibit. All other exhibits are attached. Approval of the state? Yes. Approval of the defense? Yes. All right. 6.44 p.m. on that. Here All right, we are in recess then. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.
back on the record. Appearances are as they were before. At about 7.20, we were notified that the jury um, is tired and they'd like to break for the night. So I assembled everyone here. The jury will be brought out, including the alternates who have been uh, on a separate floor, so that I can read a modified instruction 50 with them. Hopefully Jen was communicating with them, but yeah, go ahead. We'll have them all brought in. While we're still waiting, uh, we will, there's some logistical issues, and so we're going to have the jury brought in at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Have them report at 9. There's a couple of other juries. I This morning, some of their parking spots were taken, so I want to make sure that they're taken care of, and they've been here late. So um, there's a couple other juries that are starting tomorrow. So there's some logistical issues with civilian bailiffs, deputy bailiffs, so it will be smoother if we have them come at 9. All rise for the jury. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I know we have our three alternates as well. Um, but since you will all be now, minus the three, uh, stopping your deliberations for the evening, it's important that I read to you, at least modified from the original instruction that you've heard me uh, read multiple times. But you may not continue your deliberations uh, once you are outside that jury room, do not discuss this case with anyone else. Um, this is not limited to face-to-face -face conversations. It also extends to all forms of electronic communications. Do not use any electronic devices, such as a mobile phone or computer, text or instant messaging, or social networking sites to send or receive any information about this case or your experience as a juror. If you come in contact with the parties, lawyers, or witnesses, do not speak with them. For their part, the parties, lawyers, and witnesses will not contact or speak with the jurors. Do not listen to any conversations about this case. Do not research any information that you personally think might be helpful to you in understanding the issues presented. Do not investigate this case on your own or visit the scene, either in person or by any electronic means. Do not read any newspaper reports or listen to any news reports on radio, television, over the internet, or any other electronic application or tool about this trial. Do not consult dictionaries, computers, electronic applications, social media, the internet, or other reference materials for additional information. Do not seek information regarding the public record of any party or witness in this case. Any information you obtain outside the courtroom could be misleading, inaccurate, or incomplete. Relying on this information is unfair because the parties would not have the opportunity to refute, explain, or correct it. Do not communicate with anyone about this trial or your experience as a juror while you are serving on this jury. Do not use a computer, cell phone, or other electronic device, including personal wearable electronics applications or tools with communication capabilities to share any information about this case. For example, do not communicate by telephone, blog post, email, text message, instant message, social media post, or in any other way on or off the computer. Do not permit anyone to communicate with you about this matter, either in person, electronically, or by any other means. If anyone does so despite your telling them not to, you should report that to me. I appreciate that it is tempting when you go home this evening to discuss this case with another member of your household but you may not do so. This case must be decided by you, the jurors, based on the evidence presented in the courtroom. 
People not serving on this jury have not heard the evidence and it is improper for them to influence your deliberations and decision in this case. After this trial is completed, you are free to communicate with anyone in any manner. These rules are intended to assure that jurors remain impartial throughout the trial. If any juror has reason to believe that another juror has violated these rules, you should report that to me. If jurors do not comply with these rules, it could result in a new trial involving additional time and significant expense to the parties and the taxpayers. You are to decide the case solely on the evidence offered and received at trial. I know you've had a long day. I really appreciate the time and attention that you're giving. Enjoy the rest of your evening. We will have you report tomorrow at 9 a.m. All rise for the jury. All right, thank you. Anything we need to address prior to breaking for the evening ourselves from the state? No, thank you, Your Honor. From the defense? No. All right, thank you, everyone. We are in recess. Have a good night. We'll see you tomorrow at 9.